Hi, my name is Angela Weaver and I'm with the APDA, the American Parkinson Disease Association Greater St. Louis Chapter. We provide programs and services for those affected by Parkinson's disease and their families. Right now during this difficult time, many of our programs are online and virtual so that you can watch them and attend from home. You can visit our website for more information and for all of our online programming. From our homepage, you can visit our virtual links just by clicking on the box in the middle of the page. There you will find links to all of our programming that we are currently offering online. We have everything from dance, improv classes, mental exercises, tremble clefts, and more. We also offer exercise classes live streamed on our YouTube page daily. Simply follow the links and come exercise with us right from your own home. We offer seated classes, standing classes, Tai Chi, yoga, and more. Come see all the exercise classes that we have to offer. The APDA's mission is that every day we provide the support, education, and research that will help everyone impacted by Parkinson's disease live life to the fullest. Visit us today and check out all that we have to offer. Good morning and welcome. My name is Leslie Chambers. I'm the president and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. On behalf of all of the staff, the volunteers, and our boards of directors, thank you so much for joining us for the third annual Midwest Parkinson's Congress, which is hosted this year by both our St. Louis and our Midwest chapters at APDA. APDA is the largest grassroots network dedicated to improving the quality of lives for people with Parkinson's disease and their care partners through a host of services and programs in three major areas, including information and referral, health and wellness, and education and support, such as the program like this one today. We also dedicate many resources to improving the general public's knowledge and understanding of Parkinson's disease as a major healthcare issue in this country and around the world. And we invest significant resources in cutting edge research designed to find effective treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. We are so excited that you are with us today. We have an outstanding group of expert presenters and I know and I hope that after you leave the conference, you will feel much more informed and empowered as you face the challenges of Parkinson's disease going forward. I would like to thank our many sponsors. We have so many of them, and um, I won't have time to thank all of them, but please do join me in thanking all of our sponsors. And I would like to give a special shout out and thank you to our top sponsors and collaborators. So please join me in thanking our champion sponsors, the James and Allison Bates Foundation and the JCA Charitable Foundation. I would also like to thank and recognize our collaborating sponsors, Acadia Pharmaceuticals, Amnio, Emerson Hermetic Motors, and Kiawa Kieran. Please take time today to visit our sponsors resource booths. You will find all kinds of information and tools and resources, and you will find out specifically how our amazing sponsors support the Parkinson's community. And you don't have to worry, when you visit the resource booths, the expert presenters will still be broadcast live uh, when you are at the booths. So please check them out. So once again, thank you. And without further delay, let us start our program.
Hello, I'm Scott Hunter, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Amnil Pharmaceuticals. We are very excited to be part of this incredible event, and we are confident it will provide a great spirit of community, education, and inspiration for people living with Parkinson's, their care partners, and families. At Amnil, our team comes to work every day with all of you in our minds and hearts. We are passionate and dedicated to our work in Parkinson's disease. Again, we are so glad to partner with you today in this event and wish you the very best. Welcome, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. And I wanna really thank and shout out to the APDA, which has uh, supported this and also supported our Advanced Research Center at Washington University. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I like to start off with my uh, financial disclosures because I think that's important, particularly since I was involved with the Institute of Medicine report on conflict of interest in medical research, education, and care. So these are important. As you can see, my relationships with uh, industry is zero. So let me tell you what I want to talk about today. I, I know what I was asked to talk about. I was asked to talk about advances in Parkinson's research. But what I think is particularly timely is to give you a little bit of information on how COVID uh, pandemic has affected research. Then I want to focus in on some of the causes of cognitive problems that develop in Parkinson's research, how, how we're addressing that and potential new treatments down the road. This is not a survey of all new drugs that can be done elsewhere, but this is really focusing on some specific research issues. First, let me give you some information about how COVID pandemic is affecting research. The first thing initially, that is halted all face-to-face -face clinical studies. These are just starting to re-begin in the lab and mostly at this point now with what we call incidental research. And incidental research means people are already coming to our center for uh, clinical care can at that time participate in research studies. And so that would be things done incidentally to their clinical care, which doesn't require them to come in at a separate time. It also initially stopped all lab work in the hospital uh, and in the medical campus, but that was very temporary and that is restarted and is going at a, a substantially increased pace at this point. I would really point out, however, that even when our face-to-face -face clinical studies were stopped and our research with people was stopped, and even when the lab research was stopped, research did not stop. In fact, at that point, even though people didn't come to the clinic or come to the medical school campus, they were working remotely. In fact, all my people were full-time busy. Uh, this gave us an opportunity to do additional data analysis, increased writing of manuscripts to report our uh, research, and actually resulted in increased grant submissions at that time. So we were incredibly busy. In fact, it really gave us the opportunity to do this data analysis and error checking in all of our work. And this is something that's difficult to do uh, on a regular basis when we're so busy collecting data. So yes, there's twofold effects of COVID. Some things were uh, slowed a bit, but really research kept going at a fairly substantial pace. And now, as I hinted, we're moving forward. We are reduced in our face-to-face, -face, but it is starting to move forward with this incidental work. Lab research has really come almost up to full go uh, for us, but we're maintaining social distancing and doing it appropriately. And of course, with clinical research, we have our personal protective uh, stuff like ma uh, masks, hand washing, face uh, things. So we're really minimizing the risk to any participants as well as to our research personnel. This is incredibly critical. So much for the COVID issues. Let me now move on to talk about some research. And just to set the stage for that, let's just briefly in one slide review Parkinson's disease. 
So most people are very well aware of the movement problems, tremor, slowness, stiffness, postural instability, falling, soft voice, that's well known. In addition, there can be psychiatric problems and those things include apathy or lack of motivation, anxiety, low mood or depression, or even seeing things that aren't there. Those are clustered in a group of things we call psychiatric problems, which can be different from cognitive or thinking problems. Now here we, I'm using some terms that seem more technical. Executive functioning really means doing things in a sequential fashion. So one thing after another, following directions. Visual spatial function is understanding where you are in the environment or knowing how to get from here to there. And those kinds of things are early thinking problems in people with Parkinson's and then eventually can develop dementia. So these issues with cognitive impairment, that's what I wanna focus on more because those are the components of Parkinson's disease we really have no good treatments. We have a lot of medicines for the movement problems. We have deep brain stimulation for the movement problems. We have medicines for the psychiatric problems. We have none for the cognitive problems. And are these different spheres or areas of Parkinson's, are they distinct? Or are they overlapping? How does that fit together? So here's some research that's actually addressing that. A lot of times we group people or are categorized people with Parkinson's into different subtypes, tremor predominant or falling and stiffness. And those can break up the groups of people with Parkinson's and give us some clue about their prognosis, but it doesn't describe maybe 30% of people. So it's not a very good way of, dis of distinguishing or categorizing people with Parkinson's. Whereas this particular study that Megan Campbell in our office and our group led tries to distinguish people based upon their motor features, as well as their psychiatric features, as well as the cognitive problems. And these are the various kinds of features that were assessed. And you put all these together, and we applied this to over 150 people. And we see that people, oh, everybody has motor abnormalities, but some people who are mostly motor only, and that if we look at the right side of this graph, these are mostly motor manifestations separate from the people who have cognitive difficulties, thinking problems and motor, or psychiatric problems and motor. So we seem to be able to separate those groups, and this can actually describe and classify 99% of people with Parkinson's. So it's a big advantage for classification, but does it matter? And here, what she did in following up this large cohort of people found that those who had motor and substantial cognitive problems had a higher risk for dementia and developed dementia quicker than those people who are motor only and psychiatric and motor, as well as a difference in mortality. So those people had motor only, here as we see in the green, hidden by my face, it, you want to eliminate that, it's okay. It continues to go out here. They live longer than those people with motor and cognitive or motor and psychiatric manifestations. So these classifications are not only a way of classifying and categorizing people, but those classifications have importance as far as predicting prognosis. And these curves are what we call uh, uh, life expectancy or Kaplan-Meier curves, and it shows in time how often somebody develops dementia. So after 10 years, there's a big group of these people that have trouble with dementia, whereas by 10 years, a lot of people with these manifestations, psychiatric and motor and cognitive motor, die sooner than those with motor only. So that's the classification. Now, what's underlying this? What causes these kinds of cognitive problems? And then this is going to give you some clue as to how we're investigating this in some of our new research. Well, it's well known now, if we look at this picture, this is a side view of the brain. So if you take my head and you slice me right down the center and you turn me to the side and peel off this side and look from the side, that's what we're seeing here. This is toward the front of the head or toward the eyes, the back of the head. And this area is called the brainstem. 
And we have an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein that's deposited in the lower part of the brainstem and moves up the brainstem. And when it hits this area, this is the midbrain, and this is now a cross-section through the midbrain, and somebody didn't have Parkinson's, somebody that did, this is toward the front, this is toward the back, and you see this obvious loss of the dark melanin staining cells. These are the nigrostriatal neurons. These are the brain cells that make dopamine, and there's loss of dopamine, and it gives us a dopamine deficiency. So once the alpha-synuclein reaches that part, then we develop the motor manifestations. But guess what? That alpha-synuclein can also affect higher parts of the brain and get there, and that can interfere with thinking. In addition, when we hit this substantia nigra, which makes nerve cells, has the nerve cells, and let's just look over here. This is now a picture of that substantia nigra, and it has nerve cells here that send their connections higher up in the brain. Now, this is a picture, if you cut my face this way and pull my face off and look straight on, that's called a coronal section. We have the caudate and the putamen together, the striatum, and those are areas where these nigrostriatal nerve cells that produce dopamine go. So there's a deficiency of dopamine higher up. The point is that loss of nerve cells in the brainstem can cause loss of chemical messengers higher up in the brain. Is that important for Parkinson's disease? We'll come to that in a moment. So the causes of cognitive impairment that I want to talk to you about can be alpha-synuclein, this abnormal protein going in higher parts of the brain, neurotransmitter or chemical deficiencies, and I talked to you about the most commonly known one, dopamine, but we're going to talk about others, and network dysfunction, which you have no clue what I'm talking about, but I hope I'll make that clear in a moment, and neuroinflammation and free radicals, which we'll come to at the end and approaches to try to address these things, because this could be critically important in actually causing the death of nerve cells. So let's turn to our first analyses, trying to understand the role of these abnormal proteins in the brain. So let me start off by reminding you of what I used to teach that was wrong. I used to teach that when people with Parkinson's would develop dementia, real severe cognitive problems, that it was due to either the alpha-synuclein, as you see in pink, getting to higher parts of the brain, or coexisting Alzheimer's disease. Now, alpha-synuclein is the abnormal protein in Parkinson's. And in Alzheimer's disease, there's two abnormal proteins. One's called A-beta, and one is tau. And a number of years ago now, probably 14 or 15 years ago, there was a new PET tracer that we could use a PET scan to scan a person lying in the, in the PET scanner and identify whether they had abnormal A-beta in the brain. Now we can also do tau, but back then, this was the only one we could do. And we do not yet have a scan with alpha-synuclein, although I'm not gonna talk about this. Just this past week, we're making substantial progress in a group of us working together across the country. And so if there are questions later, we can talk about that. But this original study permitted us to use the PET scan of A-beta. And the idea behind this study is if we put people in the scanner and measured their A-beta, if they had it, then maybe their cause of thinking problems or to predict their development of thinking problems would have been due to coexisting Alzheimer's disease. That was the idea. And so Erin Foster and Megan Campbell again, she's a theme throughout many of these studies, did these kinds of scans. And so this is a PET scan. This is a cross section through the brain. This would be toward the front of the head, the eyes, back of the head, the left ear and the right ear. And warmer colors here indicate more of this A-beta amyloid in the brain that you see with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And here's a brain that doesn't have too much. We call this a PIB, that's the name of the PET tracer we use to identify amyloid, a PIB positive scan and a PIB negative scan. And the idea, both of these people had Parkinson's, the notion was this would indicate they have coexisting Alzheimer's. 
And when we looked at a group of people, at this point it was 207, now it's 300 actually, we would see people that were controls, healthy controls, or we would see people with Parkinson's with no thinking problems, mild thinking problems, more severe thinking problems, the risk of them having an abnormal positive PIB scan increased, but it wasn't all. Again, the thinking, our thinking, was that this would indicate Alzheimer's. Guess what? We were wrong again. And that's where we learned a lot. And the reason we learned that we were wrong is when people participated in the study, they did so until they no longer needed their brain. And then we examined their brain. And that was critical for understanding what we were actually measuring with PET. And it turned out everybody with Parkinson's who had thinking problems, every single one of them had abnormal alpha-synuclein in the brain. 60% or so also had abnormal A-beta, like you'd see in Alzheimer's disease. However, less than 5% had abnormal tau in addition to the A beta. So by the definition of pathologically of Alzheimer's disease, these people really didn't have it. And Alzheimer's was relatively uncommon in our group. Now, other people have done studies where it's a little bit higher or even much higher, but it's the majority of people with Parkinson's with thinking problems do not have coexisting Alzheimer's. They have some changes that are consistent with it, but it's really different. In fact, the distribution in the brain, the way the pattern appears, is different in people with Parkinson's from those people with Alzheimer's. But does it matter? Next. So again, let's look at survival curves. In red, these are people who had died in our study and had abnormal alpha-synuclein and A-beta. And so you can see those people with abnormal alpha-synuclein and A-beta tended to die earlier than those people who had only alpha-synuclein. And this is now the survival or from either the onset of their Parkinson's or the onset of their thinking problems. Either way, those people who had an additional abnormal protein, A-beta, tended to have worse prognosis. Does that tell you A-beta is causing the problem? Actually, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is we've also found in the brain that the A-beta concentration really corresponds to the alpha-synuclein concentration. So it could just be a marker of more severe alpha-synuclein. Now, since we're taking people's brains that no longer need it, we did other measurements there. And this was another surprise. So we all know that people with Parkinson's disease have abnormal dopamine. It's really knocked down to heck. There's not much left. And that's main focus of a lot of the treatment, replace the missing dopamine. But when we looked in the brain and actually measured other neurotransmitters in the brain, one's called norepinephrine, another is serotonin, guess what? Norepinephrine's knocked down just as much as dopamine and serotonin's knocked down not only in the parts of the brain where we see dopamine knocked out, but in higher parts of the brain. What does that mean? First of all, these are measurements made only one time in these people. Obviously, these are brain measurements made after a person's died. So that's when their Parkinson's is already really severe. So the question is, do these kinds of abnormalities occur earlier and could these other chemical abnormalities, losses of norepinephrine or serotonin, actually become targets for treatment that could potentially help thinking problems? That would be totally radical. So what, how do we sort that out? So let me remind you, this is that brain stem. Remember, alpha-synuclein starts down here. Well, it turns out the brain cells that make norepinephrine live down here and project way high up in the brain. Those that make serotonin live here and project way high up in the brain. And so these may be really early abnormalities in Parkinson's, whereas the dopamine is made in nerve cells here that projects higher into the brain. So these losses can produce chemical uh, losses here. So loss of the nerve cell here 
can reduce those chemical messengers out in the cortex. So how can we sort that out in life without getting additional brain samples? Well, here's a approach that we want to do and start implementing later this year as soon as the COVID crisis passes. There are actually PET measures of these other kinds of transmitter systems. And one is called MRB. So we can put somebody in a scanner and measure their norepinephrine transmitters or those nerve cells throughout the brain. And we can do it early in the course of people with Parkinson's. We can see if these specific abnormalities correspond with thinking problems of various types and do the same thing with serotonin. We plan to implement norepinephrine transporters later this year, already this calendar year, and the serotonin one next year and add it into our long-term PET studies. If we find these abnormalities earlier in the disease, if these abnormalities either correspond with these other kinds of behavioral changes like cognitive changes or predict them, now we've got a new target for treatment. And there are drugs that can help to address these kinds of problems. So that's a pretty hot area of research as far as I'm concerned. All right, let's take another step totally different than I told you I was gonna talk about and that's networks. This is a different kind of approach. This is lying in an MRI scanner. And when people lie in an MRI scanner, we can measure a signal called the bold signal. Now you don't care what the bold signal is, it's a bunch of noise. And if you look at one particular part of the brain when you're just lying there doing nothing and you say you have a spot right here in the brain, you'll measure this signal over time and we can measure three or 400 times, 300 times in five minutes. And you'll see this signal bounce up and down. The trick is if you say, how is that signal in this part of the brain related, which looks all noisy, to the signals in other parts of the brain? It turns out there are other parts of the brain that are running in lockstep, like you're seeing here. And these parts of the brain that run in lockstep, they form what we call resting state networks. These are important parts of the brain that work together for specific functions in the brain. So let me give you an example of that very pertinent to Parkinson's disease. So if we look at Parkinson's disease with PET and use a tracer called fluoridopa with PET, now I'm switching gears on you a little bit, that shows there's a deficiency. This is again a cross section through the brain, the front of the brain, the back of the brain. And there's loss of those dopamine nerve cells in the back part of the, caud of the caudate and the putamen, mostly in the putamen. And if we take an MRI scan and we make a region like this of over the caudate, and this is the anterior putamen and the posterior putamen, so different parts of this place that where dopamine is lost, and there's greater loss back here, less here, and, and here only when the disease gets to be more severe. If we look at that and then put somebody in a MRI scanner and put regions here and see how these regions are working in lockstep with other regions. In other words, what are their networks? We find this. So here is an image of the uh, left caudate, the anterior putamen, the posterior putamen, and these are in healthy controls. And this is just show showing the parts of the brain that are working together as one of those resting state networks in people that are healthy controls. And here's how it's working in Parkinson's, and here's the difference. And what we see is this huge change in the brain stem and a back of the brain we call the cerebellum. And it actually goes up through here. So this is what we call a resting state functional connectivity change that turns out the change here correlates with the severity of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. But we can play this game, not just with these specific parts of the brain, but with all parts of the brain and see how the entire brain is working. And when we do that, we get these cool colored maps of the brain and the colors indicate networks that are working together. So the red network works together, the green network works together. And when we do that, we can find a number of network changes that occur in people with Parkinson's. And this is a study where we took 107 people with Parkinson's who were not demented and healthy controls and we looked at how their changes uh, were different from Parkinson's disease. And we did a bunch of different studies. And here's the kinds of things that we found rather surprising. 
So instead of it being changes that are mostly just in the parts of the brain that deal with dopamine, we actually found the thalamus, a deep part of the brain, the back of the brain called the cerebellum, and visual parts of the brain and higher parts of the brain that have to do with motor function. These were very abnormal. And these dots here represent differences between Parkinson's and healthy controls. And so this is showing that the abnormalities in the brain are way beyond just the dopamine system. Again, more evidence, and this is now what we call resting state network evidence of dysfunction. So how does that relate to everything else? So Megan Campbell, here she goes again, looked at the strength of some of these networks. And this is a network called the somatomotor network. And this is the dorsal attention network, it has to do with cognition. This is more to do with motor. And the strength of those networks correlates with the amount of alpha synuclein we actually measured in the spinal fluid in these people. Now this is evidence that the resting state networks directly relate to the degree of pathology with alpha synuclein in the spinal fluid, which we think reflects what's going on in the brain itself. The spinal fluid bathes the brain, so that gives us an idea. And in fact, if we look at connections between different resting state networks, in this case, it's called the dorsal attention network to the frontal, frontal uh, parietal control network. You don't need the specifics, but these are network changes that are going on in the brain. People who have changes in their thinking have, uh, can be predicted by changes in these networks. And so now we're showing network abnormalities predict subsequent declines in cognition. So how do we treat this? Well, now I'm gonna to totally shift gears and end up with just a couple of slides about this. This person is Lara Dugan. She's not even a neurologist but she's a great neuroscientist. She's a geriatrician and specializes in uh, internal medicine of older people. She was in our department a number of years ago and she invented, synthesized this molecule. This is way cool. So this molecule is composed of 60 carbon atoms with a bunch of these guys stuck on it. And I'll talk about these guys. The shape of this molecule is kind of like a soccer ball. The reason I'm showing you this, and if you don't know what this is, you haven't been to St. Louis or traveled in St. Louis, this is the Climatron in the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And the Climatron in the B Missouri Botanical Gardens holds or able to have a whole number of different uh, of microclimates in the world. But the structure here was invented by an architect called uh, Buckminster Fuller. Why do I tell you that? Well, it's important to be well-rounded but it's also important for your biochemistry education because this kind of molecule that has the kind of the shape of this geodesic dome are called Buckminster fullerenes after the architect or fullerenes for short. And what she did is she threw a bunch of uh, chemicals or molecules on here, atoms on here are called carboxyl groups. And it turns out that was a huge difference. This drug she made, called, we call carboxyfullerene, or C3 for short, because C1 and C2 didn't work, C3, turns out to be the most potent free radical scavenger and can knock down neural information in the brain we've ever had. And what we did, we had an animal model of Parkinson's, and we gave a bunch of animals uh, this Parkinson's starting here, and we followed them. And typically what they do is they develop Parkinson's over three or four weeks. After we gave this drug that causes the Parkinson's, then we started them on treatment with carboxyfullerene. And here's the trick. Nobody at WashU knew which animal had which. We were blinded. And Lara Dugan, who made up these uh, capsules of the way we gave the medicine, was no longer here at WashU. She's now at Vanderbilt. And she would fill them up with either the real stuff or food coloring and send them to us. And I still don't know. And I published this stuff six years ago. And it turned out what we saw when we put the data in two groups and send it to a biostatistician who had no idea what we were doing, we found this crazy thing. These animals that were treated with the C3 got better. And what I'm saying better here, this is a measure of clinical Parkinsonism. 
I'd never seen this. Typically the animals just stay the same or get a little bit worse over time. This was really amazing. So behaviorally, the motor symptoms improved. And if we use PET to measure these nerve cells and the animals that got the uh, placebo or no treatment, they were knocked down. This is the baseline of the two groups were the same after the MPTP, this is way knocked down. Those that got the carboxyfluorine, they weren't normal, but they were much better. And we measured the same thing with a different kind of PET scanner, also the improvement. And when we did the motor scoring, obviously this is much better, this is less severe. And when we actually measure the dopamine in the brain, there's way more dopamine in the animals that were treated than the ones that had placebo. So how the heck does this work? And when I published this, we had companies wanted to put this in a human trial, but I said, no. And the reason I said no, is I wanted to make sure, and I've been involved with drug studies for 30 years in Parkinson's and none of them have worked to slow the progression of the disease. And we want to do better. And the way we wanted to make it better is we wanted to be able to measure how this was getting into the brain and was it hitting the target in the brain in the way we thought. And here's what we did. We designed a study to take animals, give them the MPTP again. This is the drug that causes Parkinsonism treat them with either carboxyfullerene or placebo, but here's the trick. Now we wanted to measure neuroinflammation in the brain and what we call reactive oxygen species using PET scans. And there weren't really good measures that there were some that they weren't as good as I want. So we wanted to test new measures. And so we're gonna do that to see if we can detect those changes produced by our drug and then whether this carboxyfullerene engages those targets, reduces the degree of neuroinflammation, and then compare it with the measures we make in the brain. And so that's what we're doing. So here's an animal we've given MPTP. Now this is one of those sections. This is the top of the head, the bottom of the head, the left and the right. We inject it over here, and this is this measure of dopamine neurons, and we see we, the drug that we give knocks out those dopamine neurons. But what's going on up here? This is the surprise. These are our three different PET measures that we were wanted to try to see if we could find evidence of inflammation in the brain or reactive oxygen species. And what happens is there's a delayed response higher in the brain, it's now thinking parts of the brain, where we see these huge inflammatory responses as if inflammation may contribute to the death or dysfunction of nerve cells in higher brain that may have to do with thinking. So it's now possible if carboxyfullerene can knock this down, that would be another way of trying to reduce cortical or cognitive problems. So this is the fourth way we think there could be cognitive problems. Way one, alpha-synuclein. Way two, loss of chemical messengers not just dopamine, but serotonin or norepinephrine. Way three, network changes because you knock out different parts of the brain that causes other parts of the brain not to work right because parts of the brain work together. And now four, there might be neuroinflammation going on. And there's a lot of other evidence to support this. So carboxyfullerene might be able to hit the real mechanism of what's causing problems. I've talked long enough. Most of the work, I'm talking about done by all these other people and they're an incredible group that I'm very lucky to be able to work with. And again, I wanna thank the APDA for all of their support and they've done a terrific job with us. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much for joining us for this Congress. It's a delight to have everybody here. Sorry, my hair is a little bit of a mess. I didn't expect my camera to be so good on my, my iPad. Anyway, thank you again for the APDA for sponsoring this and joining the Midwest uh, Congress, who is joining the Midwest group and the St. Louis group for uh, bringing you this uh, program. 
Uh, well, I have a whole bunch of questions that have uh, been sent to me through chat, and I'd like to try to address some of those. And first, there's a uh, question about from uh, the person called Anonymous. It's a very common name I'm seeing among some of these questions. And the question was, can we determine the amount of alpha-synuclein a person has? And the answer to that is we can in certain ways and we cannot in other ways. So let me be more specific. What we want to know, know is the amount of alpha-synuclein in the brain. And we currently, the only way we can do that is to actually take the brain out when somebody no longer needs it, that is after they die, and we can chemically measure the amount of alpha-synuclein. A big focus of research, which I did not discuss here, but we're involved very seriously in, is developing a PET tracer that can actually directly measure alpha-synuclein in the brain. And NIH is sponsoring this research, and we're uh, working together with people at the University of Pennsylvania. This is run by a guy there called Bob Mack, a radiochemist uh, who used to be at Washington University, and we're working with people at Yale and UCSF, University of California at San Francisco, and us at WashU, and people at Penn. Uh, uh, so this group is all working together, and we're coming close to being able to do that. What we are doing now, in, because we cannot yet measure it directly in the brain with PET, is we can measure it in the spinal fluid. And that's done by taking a spinal tap. And we can take that fluid and actually quantify the amount of alpha-synuclein. That would be an indirect measure of the total amount going on in the brain. But it doesn't tell us the amount in specific areas of the brain. And that, in fact, may be critical. So to answer your question is, we can indirectly measure alpha-synuclein, not yet directly in the brain, but we are making major headway in that. The next question is, <clears throat> when is it, <laughs> this is an interesting, when is it time to change from my neurologist to a movement disorder specialist? Tough question. So first of all, we have, let me address where the data really lie for this. So there was a paper published by uh, Allison Willis. <clears throat> at the time, she was a fellow here at WashU with uh, Brad Reset, And they looked at the outcome, and the outcome meaning the length of uh, life, as well as the risk of ending up in a residential care facility or breaking your hip. So in other words, bad outcomes or of uh, progression of Parkinson's and looked at it in people who are treated by their primary care doctor versus those who are treated by their neurologist. And this was all based on people that were um, eligible for Medicare, because it was all based upon Medicare records. So it's limited to people who are 65 and older, mostly. And what they found is that people who were treated by neurologists did substantially better. They lived longer. They had better quality of life. And they ended up in a nursing home. Uh, much, much less. But you're really asking, is it better to see a movement disorder specialist? Well, I'm incredibly biased. I'm a movement disorder specialist, and I would say that's probably better. We have a lot more training, and I train a lot of people to do that kind of thing. But I don't have data to prove that. Um, then the other side of that coin is how many movement disorder specialists are available, and, and can you get in? So the first answer is, definitely see a neurologist and not just your primary care physician. And if you're able to see a movement disorder specialist, probably the sooner the better. And one reason for that is then you'll know about other research studies that are going on. And if you're interested in participating, you'll be able to do that. Let me go to another question. So there was, does age of onset play a role here? This is uh, sent in by Karen Frank. And what about genetic subtypes? And so I believe Karen was referring to the uh, studies that I was showing really at the beginning of my presentation, showing that there's different uh, subcategories of Parkinson's. We can define it by those who have predominantly motor only or mostly motor, motor and cognitive, which is thinking problems, or motor and psychiatric, which means motor and things like depression or anxiety or seeing things that aren't there, hallucinations. And those groups make a substantial difference in uh, the outcome as far as length of life and a risk of developing dementia, substantial cognitive problems. But 
the real issue is, is that different in younger people? Because somebody asked that. And we don't know that yet. This study was really a cross-section of ages of onset of Parkinson's and people, all comers, and then following them through. Uh, the other part is, does genetics contribute to that? And in our study, we uh, did not find that there was a major influence of genetics, although there was some influence by uh, the genetics for something we call APOE, which does have a slight increase in a certain kind of APOE that increases your risk of developing dementia. And then to follow up on that, let me just uh, scroll down on the questions because there's one that was very similar to that. Uh, and this is from Miriam. Uh, well, well, I'm going to skip to Miriam's question. I'll give you Miriam's question. I'll come back to the other one when I find it in a minute. Miriam asks, my husband has a diagnosis of Parkinson's-like condition. How is that diagnosed and what does the future look like for that condition? Well, first of all, Miriam, Parkinson's-like conditions can be many different conditions. So it's hard for me to predict exactly what his prognosis is. It really depends upon what other condition is being referred to. And there are many, many different Parkinson's-like conditions. So uh, that would be the major factor. And how do you make that diagnosis? Currently, we dis, uh, diagnose these Parkinson's-like conditions clinically by their manifestations, how they appear, uh, certain problems like eye movement problems or stiffness in the neck more than in the limbs or early falling, things like that that help us. But they're not absolute. And so one of the other things that there, we're doing in our research is trying to identify the different signatures in the brain that may identify these other conditions. And so, for example, alpha-synuclein, which we see in people with Parkinson's, is not the same abnormal protein that we see in people, for example, with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP, another Parkinson's-like condition. That condition has tau, a certain kind of tau, we call 4R tau. And so if we could develop a tracer, pet tracer for 4R tau, and one for alpha synuclein, then in the future that might help us to make those diagnoses. But right now it's a clinical diagnosis and there is substantial overlap. As I say, the best Parkinsonologists are 100% accurate in their clinical diagnosis, but those are doctors who don't check brains afterwards. Those of us who actually check it recognize that the overlap among clinical manifestations is really substantial. And that leads me to another question sent in by our favorite friend, Anonymous. And that is, how often should a person with PD have a brain scan? And how often? So the first question is, should they have a brain scan at all? And the second question is, what kind of brain scan if they have a, uh, uh, should they have? Because there are different kinds. There's MRI scans, there's CAT scans, there's SPECT scans, and there's PET scans. And all the stuff I was talking about was mostly with PET and the resting state stuff with, was with MR. What's done clinically most of the time is an MRI scan to look and identify whether there are other manifestations in the brain that cause symptoms similar to Parkinson's. Because there's not really... Uh, manifestations on an MRI scan that would be specific for Parkinson's disease. So to answer your question for Parkinson's disease, you don't really need it, but you're use it, it's sometimes done to exclude other conditions. As far as long-term follow-up, absolutely not needed unless something changes, makes uh, your physician or you suspect something else other than Parkinson's disease is going on. There's more commonly uh, done what we call a SPECT DAT scan. And that's a scan that looks at uh, dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And some people use that to help confirm a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Now you're talking to somebody who's incredibly biased about that. And that is, I'm somebody who's done neuroimaging research for 38 years. And I have never ordered a DAT scan clinically for a patient. Now that puts me as an outlier. And the reason for that is a DAT scan can show abnormalities in this dopamine neurons, but that you can see in other Parkinsonian-like conditions. And so it doesn't really help me in taking care of a person. Uh, that's my bias. If I want to know if they have 
uh, Parkinson's and I want to know if they respond to medicine. What I do is I give them medicine because that's really the question. So I don't do repeated uh, scans on people. Let's move forward. Uh, do brain, another one from Anonymous, do brain exercises have a long-term effect on reducing cognitive issues? What a great question. And the simple answer to that is we don't know the answer, but there's increasing data about exercising, improving the motor manifestations, actually improving quality of life as well. Uh, so I would not say no to this. I say we don't know because we haven't studied it adequately. And I see no downside in exercise and a healthy exercise plan. And everybody with Parkinson's should have an exercise plan that includes not only stretching, which is good, but also strengthening and working together with a therapist, to develop a plan for you. And that by that, I mean a physical therapist that you can then carry out on your own or with your uh, helpers is a great idea. And I think that should continue on. Uh, here's another question. Let me move on. Um, ah, yeah. My, uh, this is from SES, and it says, my uh, person with Parkinson's has all three sets of symptoms. You seem to indicate this is unusual. And I believe the three sets of symptoms that you're ta referring to are the motor, the cognitive, and the psychiatric. And uh, that's a great question. And I really wanted to discussed that earlier and I, I didn't s slip down to it. And the point is in our study, what we were looking at is how people are when they begin and through the middle stages of Parkinson's. But your point is really absolutely critical that we asked ourselves, what we are, the subtypes we see just stages or are they something that's really important when it goes to following people for a longer period of time? And the simple answer to you is, if people live a very long time, and you're absolutely right, they frequently and most commonly develop all three manifestations. But how they get there and the rate at which they get there seems to be very different based upon our three subcategories. So yes, I'm not surprised that your loved one, uh, the person with Parkinson's has all three, and we see that commonly as the disease has progressed more. All right, let me go to the, another question and another one from Anonymous. What can you do to stem the loss of thinking problems? That's the whole point of my entire presentation. Most of Parkinson's research has focused on treating the motor manifestations, L-DOPA, drugs like that, deep brain stimulation, which can help the motor manifestations, does not help the thinking problems, in fact, can impair it. Uh, so we need other approaches. And that's the whole point of our carboxyfullerene and other avenues of research that are trying to reduce the spread and severity of alpha-synuclein in the brain. And I think also some of our findings showing that there are other chemical messengers lost in the brain like norepinephrine and serotonin and thinking about designing studies to see if trying to replace those uh, neurotransmitters that are deficient in Parkinson's can help thinking is exactly the direction we need to go. Because in my opinion, the biggest problem with Parkinson's today, the biggest unmet need, need is the cognitive impairment that we're not so good at uh, treating at all. In fact, we're not good at it in any shape or form. SES asks another question, is there a way to get involved in human trials for carboxyfullerene getting on a list now for when it will happen? And the answer is the way you can get involved is you can support your local researchers. Uh, you can always volunteer to participate. And right now, uh, the real answer is uh, we're not ready to try this in people with Parkinson's. We're hoping by early next year, we're going to try it in healthy controls to make sure this drug is in fact safe for humans. This could be a total wash, but it could be pretty darn big. And then fairly soon after that, we're gonna start. And we probably will start with milder, earlier PD, people with PD, because that will be uh, easier for us to detect changes. So that's how we're gonna go forward with that. Uh, let's see, and one more, I guess that was the last question since my questions have gone away. I really wanna thank you for your attention and everybody for, for participating in this uh, 
series of lectures. I look forward to the other ones coming up. Thank you so much. everyone, I'm Angela Weaver with the American Parkinson Disease Association. I hope you're enjoying the presentations today. I'm here to get you up and get you moving. It's really good for us to move our bodies and to get up and stretch. We don't want to be seated all day long, so let's get up and move together. We're going to start with just some stretches and just some breathing really to get up and just feel better. You can do these from a seated position or you can get up and stand with me. It's your choice, whatever feels comfortable to you today. But let's start with a nice big deep breath in. Ready, reach all the way up and out. Two more, just like that. All the way down and up. One more time, big deep breath in and out. Beautiful. Let's stretch our arms and our chest. Take those arms forward. Really reach, reach, reach towards me. And now open up that chest. Stand up nice and tall. Really stretch that chest. Let's take and turn our hands towards the wall behind you. Just give me a little pulse. How about eight more? Seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Let it go shake that out. All right, let's go with a nice shoulder stretch here. We're going to take our shoulders, shrug them all the way up, push them back behind you, and down. Three more. Up 
back and down. Beautiful. Up, back, and down. Nice job. Shake out those shoulders. You guys look fantastic. Doesn't it feel good to get up and move when we've been seated, sitting for so long? All right, let's take our arms in front of us and we're gonna take those fingers, spread them out nice and wide and we're just gonna take it up and reach towards the ceiling. And let that go, do it again. Take those arms up in front, spread those fingers and reach towards the ceiling. And one more time, just like that. Arms out, fingers spread, reach towards the ceiling and down. Wonderful. One more nice big deep breath in. Everyone all together, big deep breath in and out. Oh, it feels really good to take some nice big deep breaths in. All right, let's stretch out our hands. We're going to take our palms forward right here, lift up those hands and spread those fingers out nice and wide. Now we're going to take it and we're going to make fists and now explode those fingers open. Ready? One, do it again, fists, two, fists, three, fists, four, one more, fists, and five. Good, shake that out. Nice job, guys. All right, now whether you're seated or standing, we're going to just take it to a little bit of a march. Get our heart rate up. We're just going to move those feet. Doesn't have to be a very big march. You can pump your arms if you would like, whether you're seated or standing. I'm just gonna lift those feet up off the ground. Get that heart rate up. Come on. Feels good to move, doesn't it? Keep moving those feet. Great. We're gonna just take it here a few more seconds, and then we're gonna take it a little bit slower. All right. Now, if you're standing and you'd like to hold on to a chair, that's always a good option. We're gonna take and just lift that knee up, put it down. So march again, but just nice and slow. We're working on our balance and our coordination here. Lift that knee up. Whether you're seated or standing, just lift that knee up nice and slow. Good, you can take that opposite arm out with it if you want. Or if you need to be holding on, that's fine as well. Just get that knee up. Let's go four more of them right here. Are you ready? Four, say it with me, come on. Three, two, and one. It's also good to use our voice when we've been watching something for a long period of time and not moving. It's great to use that voice. All right, we're gonna take it back to that march one more time. This time I want you to try to get it a little faster. How fast can you move those legs? Hold on to a chair if you need to, or you can hold on to your countertop, whatever works for you. And if you're seated, that's fine also. Just pick those feet up a little bit faster. You guys look amazing, keep it up. Pump those arms if you can. Almost there, you guys are doing wonderful. Nice and done. Fantastic job today, you guys. Thanks for getting up and moving with me. I really appreciate it, and it's so good for you guys. I hope you join us in our other exercise that we have. We all know how important exercise is, even if it's just for five minutes. Get up and do something every single day. We have so many exercise classes on our YouTube channel and our website, so go check them out. We have everything from Tai Chi, yoga, and exercise just like this, seated and standing. We really hope you can join us. Thanks for tuning in today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for uh, having this web meeting uh, to discuss uh, some of the ongoing challenges in Parkinson's disease. And I am going to speak uh, something about Parkinson's disease uh, and how it, 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 it controls balance and, uh, and how it dysregulates balance leading to an important problem in Parkinson's patient, which is false. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say that um, I'm very honored to speak uh, in front of um, uh, Midwest Parkinson's Disease Association, uh, uh, which is part of American Parkinson's Disease Association. 
and uh, it is it is such a pleasure and it's an honor. Uh, at the same time, I really wish it would have been much better if I could see you all in person, which I believe was supposed to be in St. Louis. Uh, and St. Louis has a very interesting close connection with what we do in, in, in Parkinson balance research, uh, because a lot of concepts that I uh, that I'm taking from and a lot of concepts that I had developed uh, comes out of my work uh, that I did when I was back um, at Washington University in St. Louis as a postdoctoral fellow. So a lot of uh, basic science work that I did there, uh, we are taking that basic science research and we are translating that into uh, treatment of Parkinson's disease. So I must say that the St. Louis and Midwest in general has a very uh, important role um, in, my, in, my, in my career development and uh, in all the work that I do uh, at this point now. Before I uh, talk about my work, I want to uh, speak a little bit about a um, very important figure in the history of Parkinson and Parkinson's research, and that is uh, Dr. George C. Kotzias. Uh, Dr. Kotzias uh, is was from New York City, and uh, he did an important, remarkable discovery. Uh, that when you give levodopa to patients with Parkinson or uh, to those affected with Parkinson, it makes that certain Parkinsonian symptoms better. In other words, uh, his work on levodopa, L-dopa, uh, actually led to the current uh, treatment. It was instrumental in current treatment uh, for, uh, for Parkinson's disease. And of course, APDA, uh, recognize uh, Professor Kotzias uh, by establishing George C. Kotzias Memorial Fellowship. And the whole idea of that fellowship was to um, uh, nurture and um, support uh, young physician scientists uh, who are interested in education or teaching of Parkinson's disease and um, research in Parkinson's disease and to move the field forward. In other words, uh, to kind of like um, support the oral mission and vision of Dr. Kotzias. Uh, and uh, I, I, I am very grateful to American Parkinson's Disease Association to uh, support me and support my work uh, with George C. Kotzias Memorial Fellowship. Uh, and uh, a lot of things that I have been doing in my research is one way or the other uh, related to uh, my um, this honorable fellowship that I got from APDA. Um, so with that, uh, I want to speak uh, a bit about what is easy and what is already um, achieved in Parkinson uh, with invention of L-DOPA, and that is treatment of tremor, treatment of tone, uh, treatment of stiffness, uh, slowness. Uh, as many of you know already that when patients take L-DOPA, which is levodopa, carbidopa levodopa, um, or one of their agonists, uh, those patients feel much better. Uh, there are a lot of motor symptoms get better, but there is something uh, which is not uh, quite responsive to treatment with L-DOPA, and that is uh, balance function. Uh, so unfortunately, L-DOPA has unpredictable effects on falling and balance function, which actually unfortunately affects approximately 70% or almost more than two thirds of patients with Parkinson, which is a major challenge because what falls does is it, it leads to a major comorbidities, like it can break bones, it can lead to intracranial bleed, it can affect significant burden to the quality of life of these people. So at the end, uh, what we want to do as a Kotzias fellow, we want to bring his vision and his mission forward. And with help of APDA, we design some research projects which uh, brings this forward, which is how we can define alternate ways to treat the balance and fall function in patients with Parkinson's disease. So we set out to examine two important questions. One is why patients with Parkinson's fall and the second question is, can we really have another type of treatment to prevent faults in Parkinson's disease? 
So to answer these two questions, one has to first ask what really causes faults in Parkinson. So there are three big problems that Parkinson patients have. One is their tremor, which is, as you all know, it's like a rapid shaking movements of the arms or the body or different body parts. Second is dyskinesia, which is frigidity movements of the body, like which is not in the frequency of tremor, but it's like a little frigidiness. It's different, uh, but it is still excessive movement. And third is dystonia, which is also abnormal twisting and turning of the body part. Uh, and sometimes it is associated with some sort of rhythmic oscillations as well. So with together tremor, dyskinesias and dystonias, what they do is they perturbate the partial positions of the body. And when there are perturbations in the posture, it makes people more likely to fall. Uh, so that's one problem. But in addition, uh, the, the patients with Parkinson also have some impairment in the muscle tone. In other words, their muscle do not talk clearly with their brain about how uh, or which part of the body is moving. And that can ultimately lead to problems in fixing the postural perturbations. But in addition to that, patients with Parkinson also have um, issues with visual perception. Uh, they do not perceive their vision, their environment normally as everybody else does. And second big problem is their own view, their perception of their own movement. In other words, if I'm moving forwards, I know I'm moving forward. Or if I'm moving to the right, I know I'm moving to the right. This kind of perception can be altered in patients with Parkinson. And if you, have, if you put all these issues together, it really creates a big problem and it causes fall. Now, uh, with a contemporary treatments, uh, we can address tremor very well. We can treat, treat dyskinesias. We can sometimes also treat dystonias. We can also improve the muscle tone, but there is a big problem. We do not have a good treatment for visual or self-motion perception. So we set out to first understand the role of the visual system and the role of the perceptual motion perception system in patients with Parkinson's disease, and then to come up with the novel ways to treat these two abnormalities in patients with Parkinson's disease. So first we focus on visual perception. So there are two problems here. Patients with Parkinson's have problem in seeing objects. They sometimes see double, sometimes things look blurred. And sometimes patients with Parkinson's don't look at the right place. When you have these kind of issues, and when you are navigating in your regular environment, you're walking in a room or walking in a hallway, clearly you will have difficulty in navigating and that can lead to uh, problems such as faults. So these problems with the visual system are not as uncommon as one would think. In fact, they are quite common. And a major study which was done, uh, I think it came out of Europe, uh, and published in Neurology Journal in 2020, not too long ago, uh, found that approximately 50% of patients with Parkinson have blurred vision. Uh, approximately 25% of these people have difficulty in reading, uh, difficulty in perceiving depth, which is very important if you're walking in a hallway or you're walking in a grocery store aisle or you're walking in general, you need to know the depth of your environment, right? You need to know how far uh, the objects are from you. And if we cannot appreciate the depth of those objects, that can clearly lead to some problems in the way you navigate an environment and it can pro uh, create problems in preventing falls. And double vision is also very important. If everything is double, you cannot really navigate in your environment better. So if somehow we can figure out a way to treat these visual problems, that can create a significant improvement in patients' quality of life in addition to improving their falls. And what we find in our research is a lot of these issues are because of impairment in eye alignment. And this is something that is not only 
uh, part of our research, but this is something that is known for, for, for many years that uh, patients who have different ophthalmological problems or different brain problems who have the misalignment in their eye, they have, they have issues with double vision. So what we are interested in finding is if patients with Parkinson have impairment in their eye alignment and how we can address that impairment in eye alignment and whether that can uh, improve their visual dysfunction. So that is one important mission of our research. So why in the world eye misalignment is so important? So, you know, as you are enjoying this gorgeous view of Taj Mahal, uh, your two eyes are aligned, right? Your right eye and the left eye, they're both quite well aligned. They're not together, they are slightly separate from each other. And because the two eyes are separate from each other, what happens is that the view of Taj, which goes to the left eye, is just a hair bit slightly different from the right eye. And when that happens, your brain views the Taj as two dimension, uh, instead of two dimensional, views it as a three dimensional image. So it's critical for slight disparity in right and left eye to get a depth, a three dimension of your view. Now, if your right eye is way too off, let's say if it is completely misaligned, then what happened? That disparity increases. And when that disparity increases, the view of Taj does not get three-dimensional, but it gets really blurred and it gets sometimes double. And that creates a big problem. And what happens eventually, our brain starts ignoring uh, uh, one eye. And what ends up being is that you either see double or you lose the percept of your depth. And, and either way, what happens is you cannot navigate in the environment so clearly, and as a result, uh, you uh, you have problems in, um, uh, in 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 fixing your partial perturbation, creating falls, and many other issues related to that, which substantially affect your quality of life. So there are two ways uh, the misaligned eye cause falls. One is by double vision and depth perception like we discussed, right? So what are the treatments for that? So one would definitely ask a question, do L-DOPA really treat double vision or does it really treat problems with depth perception? I must say that there are not many rigorously done studies on this uh, particular problem, but we do appreciate that every now and then during our clinical practice that our patients' visual deficits do not really um, uh, consistently get better when they take their L-DOPA. In other words, the effect of L-DOPA in these visual deficits are uh, rather inconsistent. Uh, there are some uh, studies, um, including one that came out of uh, St. Louis many years ago, uh, did look into that problem more systematically as well. Then second question you would ask is, okay, this is a problem with the eye misalignment. What if I fix my eye by doing an eye muscle surgery? I mean, people do eye muscle surgeries all the time. So, I mean, there are all kind of strabismus, which is present, squint. Uh, people get, they go to an ophthalmologist, they fix the eye and you are treated. So one would wonder whether eye muscle surgeries uh, would create any um, impact on, on this burden of uh, visual impairment in Parkinson's. Uh, well, it can maybe on very short-term basis, but as you may imagine, Parkinson actually is a moving target. Um, patients with Parkinson are not the same uh, every hour of the day, number one. Number two, patients are not always the same every month, right? So sometimes uh, this is a de degenerative process. So what you are now, are not you're not gonna be the same six months from now, or a year from now, or two years from now. So if you then get your eye muscles surgically operated, then that outcome of the surgery will not be equally beneficial for you six months from now, or a year from now. You want something which is uh, adaptable 
to your um, disease state. In other words, if I treat your eye muscle problems, your visual uh, problems or your binocular problem with some kind of treatment, that treatment should then be adaptable in future. In future, I can change the treatment setting uh, so that we can uh, improve your vision and titrate it uh, to that state in your life or in that state of neurodegenerative disease. So then the last thing which comes to mind is neuromodulation, deep brain stimulation, which is quite popular nowadays. And a lot of you may already know about deep brain stimulation. So before we dive into deep brain stimulation, which was the topic of investigation, we looked at whether we can use neuromodulation uh, to treat the visual dysfunction or falls. I want to talk a little bit about neuromodulation. So what is neuromodulation? So I'm gonna show you this video clip. In this video clip, what you will see uh, a little bit about basic about neuromodulation. Neuromodulation or functional electrical stimulation restores or blocks damaged nerve activity. All body functions are controlled by the nervous system. FES uses artificial low-level electrical impulses applied to the nervous system to replace or block the damaged neurons and signals, restoring lost function. Think of neuromodulation by FES like a faucet, able to be turned on so that the impulse can flow, slow down, be intermittent, or even stop. FES can aid those with neurological disorders such as Parkinson's disease by way of deep brain stimulation or DBS. Deep brain stimulation blocks signals from targeted areas of the brain to reduce tremors and enable individuals to walk more normally. So what we did is we asked whether this neuromodulation which is adaptable to a patient's ability uh, to titrate to certain motor function, whether we can use that uh, to treat your visual symptoms, whether we can come up with a technology of deep brain stimulation that can improve your visual function. So what we did is we first looked for the effects of deep brain stimulation on the treatment of double vision and depth perception. So here is one example of uh, some of our experiments where the patients with Parkinson who had deep brain stimulation was looking at the image. As patient was looking at the image, what we did, we plotted the position of their right eye, which is uh, red color, and the position of the left eye onto a little chart. What you see here is the y-axis on the chart is the vertical up down position of the eye, and horizontal uh, axis is the right left position of the eye. What you're seeing is the patient's right eye was a bit misaligned. As a result, when patient is asked to look at the image, the left eye is looking over here while the right eye is looking a little bit to the right side. And as a result, what happens is the patient is perceiving blurred, right? When you turn DBS on, then what happens is both eyes are now aligned. As you can see, the red and green both are kind of superimposing each other and the patient's image look much clearer. So in other words, in our pilot results that we, stud we have been studying, what we found that when we d turn DBS on, it improves the ocular alignment, the alignment of the two eyes. So then we ask what really DBS does uh, to improve uh, their alignment. So as a next question, what we looked at is we took the MRI of these patients with, who had deep brain stimulators, uh, and then we located the position of the stimulating electrode. And then we uh, did a computer simulation of the electrical currents. What we find in this graph, the green um, uh, organ here of the brain, green part of the brain is something called subthalamic nucleus. That's the part where deep brain stimulation electrode is seeding. And then uh, the red cherry that you see is the simulated electrical current. 
what you are seeing is that whenever patients had that location of this electrical current on the dorsal aspect on top of this green nucleus, patients were having good responses. But when it was lower down, as you can see here, patients were not having responses. So with this message, what we understood is that in this subthalamic nucleus, which is green, when you are stimulating the dorsal aspect of it, putatively, that aspect is then modulating patient's brainstem, which is a different part of the brain, where there is more of the neurons which are responsible for eye movement. And then via brainstem, this subthalamic deep brain stimulation is affecting the part of the cerebellum, which is on the back side. And the cerebellum then uh, works on the areas of the brain, which improves the eye alignment. So in other words, uh, our pilot data suggests that subthalamic nucleus modulation actually works on eye alignment via brainstem and the cerebellum. So then we ask the second question, what else happens to the patients with Parkinson's disease? And that is, we found that they're not looking at the right place. So what you are seeing in this little experiment that we did uh, is that patients are asked to find a loaf of bread. Now, if we ask a normal person to look for the loaf of bread, they may look at the bowl or they may look at the toaster oven or they may go towards the drawer or the fridge, right? Uh, so what we plotted here is when we ask a normal person to look around, they look around um, this image to look for the loaf of bread and all these little dots, which is the green color, it shows the position of their gaze in that particular location, which we measured with our experimental equipments. Uh, and what, what it turns out, as they found little, little time uh, on the kitchen counter, little time in the freezer door, somewhat time in the bowl, and finally, they found the loaf of bread and they found a lot of time, which shows by the red dot here, red zone here, they spent a lot of time fixating the eyes on loaf of bread. Now, when I ask the same question to the Parkinson patient, what turns out is they're looking actually at the toaster oven and they spent a lot of time at the toaster oven. They did not find piece of bread, but they kept looking at the toaster oven. In other words, uh, what happens, they kept looking at the wrong place where was, there was no bread still, they kept looking at it and they didn't even get to the loaf of bread, as you can see here. So in other words, uh, eyes only see what mind is prepared to comprehend, right? So this Parkinson patients, they, they, their mind was prepared to comprehend that bread piece is going to be over here. And they kept looking over here, but they did not find it, but they still kept looking over here. They did not move on. So it's very interesting. They have this prior memory in their brain about the piece of bread is supposed to be on the toaster oven, but it is not there. They did not move on, unlike healthy people. So this actually was ended up being a problem because it took them forever to find a bread and they never found a bread. And imagine now you're walking and you're looking for something or you're trying to uh, come up with an unexpected circumstance, but your brain is only prepared to see something which is expected and you are going to not adapt to that unexpected circumstance and that's going to lead to fall. So this is a big problem. So what we then did is we turned on the deep brain stimulator and we asked the patient to do the same experiment again. Now I'm going to show you the exact same patient, uh, but with deep brain stimulator on, finding a cup of coffee. So this is an example of a normal person who is asked to find a cup of coffee. And that person looks at the thermos here, looks at the espresso machine or a milk frother here, which is perfectly fine. I don't know why he looked at the calendar, but then he found the cup of coffee in the microwave. And that's it, boom, got it, right? Now we are looking at patient with Parkinson, again, looking for the cup of coffee, but now with deep brain stimulator on, and guess what? They got it. So it was so seamless for the patients to get to the object 
uh, without any prior experience to that object uh, when Deep Brain Stimulator was on. So that was the story about the visual perception. They were able to uh, correct their uh, blurred or double vision. They were able to get their gaze looking at the right place at the right time in timely fashion. So the next question that we asked was what really happens to their perception of their own motion? Because as you can imagine, as you're walking, you're perceiving your visual surround, but you also want to perceive your own motion, right? And that is a super critical to prevent falls. So to study this uh, motion perception, we had a very unique system in our lab, which is generally utilized by NASA to train astronauts. And that system is called hexapod. So what happens, the patients with Parkinson's sit, sit, uh, are seated on the chair over here. They are blindfolded and the chair stays on this platform and the platform moves either straight ahead to right or to the left. And the patients were supposed to tell us whether they are moving to the right or to the left. I'm gonna show you a little video of the system so that you get a bit of a perspective of this experiment. Hexapod is very unique motion delivery system. It's meant for training astronauts by NASA. Somebody in our field came up with a clever idea that they can use this system to move humans to test self. So we use this system uh, to study how well patients with Parkinson can perceive their own motion. And the reason why we use blindfold in a dark room is because we wanted to obscure their visual. We wanted to isolate uh, their vestibular or balance um, organs. So what we found is the patients with Parkinson were unable to precisely perceive their motion. They were unable to tell the direction of the motion. They were unable to tell whether they are moving to the right or moving to the left. Um, they were not able to do that as effectively as normal person would do. And uh, as a result, as some of these patients were walking, uh, they would veer on the one side. And often that led to loss of balance and fall. So this is a big problem. So then we ask whether we can utilize this deep brain stimulation uh, to treat balance function. And this was real serendipity as many other uh, discoveries happen in science. It remem I remember very well that I was in the OR in my training with my mentor and my hero, Melan DeLong. And uh, with Dr. DeLong and I, we were implanting subthalamic deep brain stimulator in a patient in the operating room. And as some of you may know, as we implant these deep brain stimulators to the patients, uh, patients are alert after a certain uh, stage of the surgery. And as we are implanting, we turn on specific aspects of the deep brain stimulator electrodes and we ask patients of their experience. We examine whether their tone is better, whether the tremor is gone. So as we were doing that exercise in the OR, what we discovered, our patient told us, oh, I am feeling that room is spinning. And that was kind of a news to me. I was wondering why patient is telling me that I am spinning. I gave him a benefit of doubt and I said that, okay, fine, you are in the OR, probably you are not thinking right, maybe that's why you are spinning. I moved on. We implanted this patient, the surgery was successful, his Parkinson was treated. Then we did a little modeling and when we brought the patient back to the clinic. Uh, in this model, what you see here is that brown area is a subthalamic nucleus. This purple area are the tracks which are connected to the cerebellum, which is in the back side of the brain, to the thalamus, which is uh, on the top of the subthalamic nucleus. And these different uh, uh, cylinders are the electrodes of the DBS. Whenever I discover, whenever uh, we turn on this particular part of the electrode, the patient was feeling that he is spinning. And that actually happened on multiple other patients. Whenever we stimulate a particular part of the electrode, they feel they are spinning. But when we stimulate the other part of the electrode, they don't feel spinning and their treatment, uh, their Parkinson is treated. So then I wondered, what is it that I am stimulating that makes them feel spinning? 
which reminded me of my experiment that I did with my mentor in St. Louis. Uh, what it is, is that whenever we stimulate this little electrode is actually the current is stimulating this tracks, this pathway, which connects the balanced part of the cerebellum to the higher brain. So that gave us a new area of thinking that now the spinning is a bit annoying, the spinning is a bit side effect, but we can make this technology, this concept in its good way, and we can utilize, we can leverage this whole pathway and this whole mechanism, which is right next door to subthalamic nucleus to improve their balance function. So what we did is we came up with a novel experiments, which was funded to some extent by uh, APDA and also to some extent by American Academy of Neurology uh, and uh, RRND of the Veterans Affairs, the federal government. And what we discovered is that when we are on certain aspect of the subthalamic nucleus, we not only improve their Parkinson, but we also change the ability of these patients to precisely perceive their motion. So it was a win-win situation. We came up with, uh, we want to come up and we, uh, in our pilot studies, we came up with some ideas where we stimulate in the brain, which not only treats their Parkinson, but it also improves their visual function, and which also improves their ability to perceive motion precisely. And then, um, put them in a happy world. Now, what I'm saying here is these are some pilot findings that we find. We are still doing some experiment in our labs uh, where we are looking for the most ideal location in the brain, uh, which is the golden spot for improvement in all kinds of Parkinson's symptoms, as well as the balance and the visual symptoms. So in summary, uh, what we find, what I want to say, tell you is Parkinson's disease patients fall frequently. No news to many of us. Uh, it, Parkinson can cause problems with both vision and balance, as we learned. Double vision and depth perception are issues, and these are issues are due to the misalignment of two eyes. And then there is impaired perception of their own motion, which is also a problem in patients with Parkinson's disease. And last but not least is we are trying uh, very hard every day in our laboratory to find the areas of the subthalamic nucleus and areas around it, which is ideal to improve the visual function, which is ideal to improve the balance function, as well as it also treats all the Parkinsonian symptoms. Now, we have pilot data that I showed you that do show some promise, but we still need several years of research to finalize those locations and to come up with a solid uh, treatment plan for the patients to improve the Parkinson from all different perspectives uh, to prevent fall and to conquer Parkinson's disease and to give you the best quality of life. With that, I want to thank you all. I want to thank American Academy of Neurology Career Development Award, George C. Kodzia's Memorial Fellowship, uh, Dystonia Medical Research Foundation uh, re Awards, uh, NIH grants uh, that support some of our work on dystonia, and of course, philanthropic supports from my department and my institute, Neurological Institute uh, at University Hospitals in Cleveland. Uh, and uh, Penny and St uh, Steven Weinberg uh, Chair in Brain Health, which also support parts of my research. Uh, and with that, I'm open to uh, your questions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good morning or almost good noon, good afternoon to those who are on East Eastern time zone. Um, and thanks for attending uh, my lecture. Uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, many of you were interested. As I can see, there are several questions. So um, I think I should be able to address uh, all of these questions. Uh, so I will go to the first question from uh, anonymous uh, user who said, if you have issues with your eyes, can you go to a regular eye doctor or there are eye doctors who specialize in PD? 
So uh, I must say that, you know, if you have issues with eye, I would definitely go to eye doctor because, uh, because generally Parkinson's disease affects patients who are in their elderly age group. Uh, you can have a lot of many, I mean, common things are common. Retinal detachment is common, cataract is common, uh, you know, refractory errors are common. So uh, these things uh, are uh, present in everybody and Parkinson patients are not spared with it. So if you have any eye problems, I would first go to an eye doctor. Of course, then your eye doctor would be able to tell you that what your exact problem is. And sometimes, hopefully, they would be able to also tell you that whether the problem is really, could be related to the brain or not. And in that case, uh, you can bring up to your movement disorder neurologist or a neurologist. Um, there are some uh, neurologists who have special interest in eyes, um, like myself, uh, or there are, uh, there are a few around in the world, uh, in the country, uh, but there are not many. Uh, but you can uh, certainly ask your eye doctor or your movement disorder neurologist for a recommendation uh, of person who could be a good person to treat your uh, ocular or vestibular problem if there are any in, in your institute or in your town, and they should be able to help you with that. But if you have any eye problems, I would definitely first run path and off. The second question comes from Sherry, who says that uh, the father was diagnosed with a cousin of Parkinson. He walks bent over, and when we ask him to stand straight, he said he it makes him short of breath. And why is this? So, um, well, I mean, it's a good question. I don't know which cousin because Parkinson has more than one cousin. Uh, but what I can imagine is that um, Sherry's father has um, uh, a Parkinson's disease or Parkinsonism, some sort of Parkinsonism with a trunk bending, which we call tetraformia. Uh, so whenever the person tries to stay straight or actually tries to walk, uh, a trunk bends further, and sometimes it can make them work harder and that can make short of breath. Sometimes it can change lung dynamics, which can also uh, make them short of breath. So there are many reasons for somebody to get short of breath. And of course, this is something uh, your neurologist or movement disorder neurologist or a neurologist should be able to help you with, uh, with that particular question. The next question is um, uh, from Carol. Uh, the question is, there are neuro-ophthalmologists. Would you recommend them? The answer is yes. I mean, of course, uh, they are great. Um, they are experts in brain and eyes. And so, of course, uh, they can be some of uh, good resources for you, you to, for you to utilize. Uh, neuro-ophthalmologists can be neurologists or they can be ophthalmologists. But either way, they kind of all common ground is brain and the eye and its connection. So, um, certainly, uh, I would recommend if you have any eye problems uh, which are not related to cataract or retina, uh, if it is related to brain and neurodegeneration, uh, you are more than welcome to get input from your neuro-ophthalmologist. And your movement disorder neurologist or a neurologist would be able to recommend any of them if they are in your institute. Uh, the next question again comes from the anonymous uh, user. Uh, and the question is, why does... Um, PK cause intense neck pain. I believe PK is Parkinson. Uh, cause intense neck pain. Does it worsen actual spine pain issues? So Parkinson's disease uh, can lead to many. Um, so it depends, of course. Uh, if you have a neck dystonia, which is abnormal twisting and turning of the neck, which is possible with Parkinson. If you have a terrible dyskinesia, which is involuntary movement of the head and trunk. If you have tremor. Um, if you have any kind of uh, excessive movement or tr tonic posturing of the neck, uh, that can eventually then lead to osteoarthritis. And these are some of the very common um, um, consequences of uh, hyperkinetic movement disorders. Uh, and that can lead to neck pain also. Dystonia of the neck itself can lead to muscle neck pain. So yeah, there are many reasons for our stiffness can also lead to neck pain. So there are many reasons for the intense neck pain. And it can worsen, worsen the spine pain issues if there is a, a, a lot of abnormal involuntary movement, then you are uh, you get more spinal arthritis and osteoarthritis, and that can worsen your spine pain issues. Uh, next question, question comes from Mr. Roger Allens. Uh, the question is, my wife has tremors sometimes. She has no control of her body from waist up. 
Uh, is there any solutions to control her tremor? Yes, uh, of course, there are many, uh, many solutions to control tremor. There are many drugs, many medications, many uh, non-medical surgical therapies for tremor. A lot of different things can be done for tremor. And I highly recommend Mr. Allen's to take your wife to uh, a neurologist or a movement designer neurologist um, who can help you further with this. Uh, the next question comes from Kathy. Uh, uh, and Kathy actually has two questions. I will address both of them together. Probably I should be able to. Yeah, uh, actually one at a time. Uh, so Kathy, first question uh, she asked is, would a MDS, which is movement disorder neurologist, treat the visual problem or would an ophthalmologist? So the question here is, it depends what your visual problem is. Of course, when my patient tells me, I, I do eye movements also, and I'm also movement disorder neurologist, so I can address some of the basic eye movement problems, for example. But if some of my patients tell me that there are some issues with the eyes, I, of course, send them to ophthalmologists first just to make sure that they don't have cataract, their retina is good, their um, ocular globe is good, which is out of my areas of expertise. So if there are any visual problem, I would definitely first get screened sort of by ophthalmologists to make sure that there is nothing that they can do about it. Then you can talk to your movement disorder neurologist to see whether it has any relationship with the Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, there, there, there is much work that came out um, about, as you know, about the visual problems in Parkinson and uh, sometimes some DBS um, settings can make vision worse. Sometimes they can make it better, but they can also make double vision worse depending on the electrode location and the stimulation. So your movement disorder neurologist can address into those issues if that's not really an ophthalmology related visual problem. So it's kind of like a collaborative approach between your neurologist and an ophthalmologist about how to address your visual problem. The second question Kathy has is, I have DBS, but now I have blepharospasm. Is this common? Well, blepharospasm is a relatively common condition, I would say, but it is not like, I mean, um, it is possible that you have blepharospasm, uh, and uh, I can't tell whether your DBS is causing it or, or blepharospasm is part of your uh, neuroregenerative condition, which can be addressed further with your DBS or which way um, we can address that. And I strongly recommend you uh, talk about that with your neurologist um, to address uh, this, uh, this, this concern. Uh, and uh, perhaps um, uh, they should be able to help you. Uh, if not with DBS, I know blood prostatum can also be treated with uh, botulinum toxin injection. So there are many ways we can address and help you perhaps. And talk to your doctor. Uh, so, uh, next question comes from Larry J. Uh, and oh, wait, something came before Larry J. Sorry. Uh, so, the next question comes from SES. I don't know if it is a full name or it is. Um, so, I'm going to call it SES. So, the SES is asking with, with the visual perception and improvement with DBS on. Uh, was that also DBS placed in STN? Yes. Uh, so the study that I showed you, they were all STN DBS locations. I do have cohort of patients with GPI as well, and we strive to look, extend our investigation from STN to GPI, but we want to first finish our studies in STN, and the next phase of the project, we will look into GPI. So we have not looked into GPI yet, but that's in our radar. Uh, the question comes from, next question comes from Larry J. Uh, the question is, I have a problem not blinking, which causes blurriness. Is there anything I can do? Uh, blurriness is a big problem in Parkinson's disease, and commonly it comes because of the drying of the retina, I'm sorry, of the cornea, and uh, because enough lack of enough lubrication. So what you can do is, of course, you need to remind yourself to blink. Uh, and that's a that's easy fix. Of course, I know it is easy said than done. Uh, so what I recommend is you can use frequent um, artificial tears, uh, eye drops, which can keep it moist. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, there are also forms of uh, ointments which are available, which is artificial tear ointment. But uh, I typically use that uh, for nighttime purposes on patients who have. Uh, for example, Bell's palsy, but not the Parkinson patient. I typically tell them to use artificial tear drop. That is easier during the day. Um, so, um, next question: If norepinephrine and serotonin levels are low, would antidepressant that raises those levels help with PD symptoms? 
if you have depression and if you treat depression, it will help you with any your any of your chronic neurological problems. In my Parkinson patient, number one cause of lack of success in treatment of Parkinson is untreated depression. So yes, if you have depression and if it is not treated, I would highly recommend that you get your depression taken care. The next question again comes from SES, uh, uh, who is asking, did you look at DBS both in STI and GPI? I believe we answered that question. Uh, so uh, we looked into STI and uh, we are looking into STI and we finished some experiments, we published some papers which are in review um, and in future experiment we will look into GPI. Next question comes from Pat Cullen, uh, who is asking, what stage of Parkinson was your pilot group for this DBS? So I must say they were quite advanced uh, and um, uh, they all were refractory uh, to uh, medical therapy uh, in, in form of like they were having either dyskinesias or they were having frequent medications. Uh, so they were, I would say they were not mild uh, for the DBS group. Uh, most of them were uh, very um, advanced, rather advanced. They were not so, uh, so uh, but at the same time, in my pilot group with DBS, they were not super advanced because our uh, studies require them to report um, uh, with accuracy. So they need to have a good uh, cognitive state as well. So while they were advanced, they were also cognitively fit. We had few patients who were, uh, I have few patients in my practice who, who have really advanced stage of Parkinson's and they have DBS for years. and. They're not doing very well cognitively, and we could not recruit those patients on our study. Uh, at what point, another question from Anonymous, uh, at what point would someone with PD pursue DBS as a solution for PD? Are there any negative side effects that come from DBS? Well, so this is a very good answer I uh, learned from my mentor, Melan DeLong. And the answer is, we are ready when you are ready. So, um, of course, there are certain limits, right? So um, first, your doctor will try you with basic medications, um, uh, with carbidopa, dopa, levodopa, with dopamine agonists, various kind of Parkinson medications. There are lots of them around. And uh, after a certain, uh, once your doctor is confident, typically it is called um, a rule of fours, so like a four year of more and uh, more than four times a day of medication dose. and uh, but but it it is kind of a variable target. Like uh, your doctor or your movement disorder neurologist who does DBS would be definitely a good resource for you to answer whether you are ready for DBS or not. But once your doctor says you are ready, then it's your decision when you are ready. So um, what I tell my patients that when you are ready, I am ready. So um, it all comes down to that. So there are, uh, well, I mean, there are, are there negative side effects that come from DBS? I would say DBS is rather um, a safe procedure. Uh, it's a, um, what my, my colleagues uh, in surgical field call it minimally invasive. Uh, it, now they do it with, um, a lot of center do it uh, with um, uh, uh, imaging guidance uh, and they make a very tiny burp hole. So surgically it has gotten much, much better technically. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we also have very good technology to program uh, deep brain stimulation nowadays. We have more than, uh, we have, uh, I, I, we have uh, three different um, 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 uh, brands of DBS available uh, in America. Uh, so it's, 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 it's getting much, much better. Uh, the side effects that come from DBS could be easily reversible by programming DBS. And if it is, not properly located, then uh, your doctor can always reposition it. So it's not a permanent lesioning procedure that it is once it is in the wrong place, it's done deals. It's not like that. So uh, in my opinion, uh, I would say DBS is fairly, uh, fairly safe. If I have a relative who is ready for DBS, I would uh, work for them. Uh, the next question, what stage of Parkinson was your pilot group uh, with DBS? I think I answered that question. Uh, it was uh, rather, uh, it was moderate to advanced Parkinson, but they were not super advanced. Gary K has a, a question, which is, I develop strange sensation in my feet, like numbness around my big toes, uh, to the point where I am uncomfortable walking. Can that be related to PD? 
Well, I mean, there are many reasons for numbness in your toe. There are many reasons for numbness. There are many reasons for sensory problems. It can range from neuropathy to uh, nerve pinch uh, to something, uh, some sort of stroke in the brain. It can be many reasons uh, for numbness. Uh, it can be, pa Parkinson can also cause many weird um, no problems that cannot, some of, some of them can be usual, some of them can be unusual. I, re I strongly recommend you discuss uh, this with your uh, doctor about um, about these problems. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very difficult for me to answer that um, on the chat, whether this is related to Parkinson or not. Uh, next question comes from Karen Frank. Uh, yes, Next question comes from Karen Frank. Karen is asking, what if DBS is placed in globus pallidus? Did you look at eye position when DBS was not in the STN? So Karen, this is something in my radar and I look forward to do that experiment, those type of studies in hopefully near future once our STN projects are more than half phase through. Uh, and uh, I have last question that is, uh, comes from the anonymous uh, user. It see, uh, and the question is, it seems that a couple of years after my elderly mother was diagnosed with PD, she developed asthma. Is there a link? Well, um, I have not noticed any obvious link between asthma and uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, I live in Northeast Ohio where um, the, these type of problems are very common. Allergies are very common. Asthma is very common. I work with veterans who have uh, robust COPD. I have not seen the obvious link between the two. Uh, so it's hard for me to tell that there was a link in, in case of your mother. Uh, the question next I get again from Anonymous is without electing to have DBS, are there studies from which one can benefit uh, their visual deficit? Yes, I mean, it all depends what your visual deficits are from. Uh, and uh, we don't have a uh, very um, well controlled, uh, uh, um, we don't have a, uh, a study which were done in contemporary. Um, using contemporary techniques that we have in the lab, looking at the effect of medications on various Parkinsonian symptoms. But that is something that we aspire to do in the uh, near future. OK, any questions? Any additional questions? I think we are good.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Gilbert, and I'm Chief Scientific Officer at American Parkinson Disease Association. My talk now will be on sleep and fatigue, and I'll focus on both how to get a good night's rest with Parkinson's disease, and the flip side, how to feel more awake during the day with Parkinson's disease. These two are obviously related issues, but they are separate and related issues. So we'll try to touch on both of those. Here's the outline for my talk. First, we'll discuss why sleep is important to someone with PD, and we'll discuss why is sleep affected in someone with PD. And then we'll delve a little deeper into how sleep is impacted in PD. And we'll discuss three separate categories. One, the sleep disorders that are associated with PD, the sleep disorders that result from PD medications, and then common PD symptoms that can impact sleep. The last part of the talk will focus on fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness. These are two related but different non-motor symptoms in PD, and they are sort of the flip side of sleep, the wakefulness uh, problems that can occur in PD. So let's start. Why is sleep important in PD? So it may be intuitively obvious to everyone listening that uh, anyone who doesn't get a good night's sleep will have problems the next day. And in PD, these problems can be more pronounced than in uh, someone in the general population. There can be worse motor symptoms. The actual PD movement problems can be worse. And then you can also have more difficulty in the non-motor symptoms. And that can manifest as worse cognition, for example. And then there is a pattern that sometimes is set up when you have poor sleep. And so that is one night you have poor sleep, you're very tired the next day, that leads to naps during the day. And then if you have naps during the day, you're not as tired as not at night and you have poor sleep at night and you can get into this vicious cycle of poor sleep at night, tiredness during the day. And so that's something we wanna try to avoid. And now why is sleep affected in PD? So as you may be aware, the pathologic hallmark of Parkinson's disease is this element called the Lewy body. And that's this pink circle in the middle of this nerve cell, which is here in this slide in front of you. Now, Lewy bodies are abnormal accumulations of a protein called alpha-synuclein. And it's thought by many to be a key element responsible for nerve death in PD. Now, this is a picture of a dopaminergic nerve. And when Lewy bodies are present in these dopamine nerves, that is where you get the motor and movement problems of PD. But these Lewy bodies can be found really throughout the brain in many, many areas of the brain, including areas of the brain responsible for sleep and wakefulness. And that is thought to be one of the reasons why sleep is affected in PD. So let's uh, discuss some of the sleep disorders that can be associated with PD. The first, REM behavior sleep disorder, rapid eye movement behavior sleep disorder, insomnia, sleep fragmentation, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea. We'll go through each one of these and how they affect sleep in PD. Your physician, if you complain of sleep problems and your physician is curious as to maybe you have one of these sleep disorders associated with PD, may order what's called a sleep study, study or polysomnography. And this is a study that can be done either in a sleep center, and that would be a facility that you go to, you sleep the night in a bed uh, that is supposed to simulate a bedroom. You're supposed to have a, a night's rest there. And while you're there, uh, various bodily uh, functions are recorded, including brain waves, oxygen levels in the blood, heart rate, breathing, eye movements, leg movements. This type of uh, analysis can on occasion be done at home as well. And so that may be something you may want to ask your physician about. When all this information is gathered, it can be very informative about how a person's sleep is performing and whether that sleep can contribute to a restful night and a good uh, restfulness the next day. So let's start with a discussion of the, one of the most common sleep disorders in PD, and that's the REM behavior sleep disorder, REM standing for rapid eye movement. To understand this disorder, we need to discuss the stages of sleep, which are depicted here in this graph. There are two basic types of sleep, 
rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep. And that's depicted here in these sections, N1, N2, and N3. You cycle through these types of sleep every approximately 1.5 hours throughout the night. REM sleep typically occurs for the first time about 90 minutes after falling asleep. And when this happens, your eyes move rapidly behind closed eyelids. And this is when dreaming occurs. Normally, people are paralyzed during REM sleep. And in REM behavior sleep disorder, a person is not paralyzed and can therefore act out his or her dreams. Now, the problem with this is it can cause injury to the person themselves. There are occasions when a person may, for example, throw themselves out of bed and cause injury, and it can certainly cause injury to the bed partner. And those are the two reasons why one would consider treating this disorder. Otherwise, the person who has REM behavior sleep disorder may not realize they have it. They may realize they're dreaming and they wake up and they don't realize that their dream has been so active, that they've been yelling out, that they've been thrashing. So in and of itself, it may not be problematic for the person with PD or the person with REM behavior sleep disorder unless they injure themselves or injure their bed partner. And so some of the treatments to consider, we may want to modify the sleep environment, and that may mean separate beds between bed partners, put mattresses on the floor to make sure someone can't throw themselves out of bed, bed rails, guard rails to protect the person, and that may be enough. If it's not enough, medications like melatonin and off-label clonazepam can be used to help to control the REM behavior sleep disorder. I must note here that REM behavior sleep disorder can be a part of what we call the premotor Parkinson's disease, which is a set of non-motor symptoms that can precede a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease itself, which means that it can precede any of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Other symptoms of premotor Parkinson's disease include poor smell, constipation, and depression. Now, just because you have REM behavior sleep disorder does not mean that you are going to develop PD if you have it in isolation, but it is definitely something that is seen in retrospect. People with PD report REM behavior sleep disorder years before their diagnosis of PD. Now, let's turn to another sleep disorder associated with PD, and that's insomnia. Primary insomnia refers to difficulty falling asleep at the start of the night. Secondary insomnia refers to difficulty falling asleep after waking up during the night, and both of these can be problematic in Parkinson's disease. Now, there are numerous medications that are on the market designed to induce sleep either in the beginning of the night or once you've fallen asleep. And these medications may be appropriate for those with primary or secondary insomnia associated with PD. However, medications that induce sleep can have unwanted side effects such as gait instability or reduced mental clarity, and they can lead to sleepiness during the day the next day. So these medications do need to be chosen carefully, and there are other potential solutions that could be uh, looked at and looked into first. And some of these are improving sleep hygiene. And so what that means is making sure that the environment, the sleep environment is as, um, receptive to sleep as possible. So you want to turn off screens. You don't want to be engaged in a, a, a phone or a device or an iPad right before sleep. That can really keep you awake in a profound way. You want to make your bedroom for sleep alone. You don't want to make it a hubbub of activity, of other activities. And you want to avoid specifically eating and exercising close to bedtime because those can rev you up and keep you awake. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. Try to induce sleep. You want to make sure that all your medications are reviewed. Medications for other conditions can keep a person awake more than, uh, than they want. And so you want to make sure that those medications are reviewed. Depression and anxiety can also rev a person up in certain ways that keep them awake, perhaps mulling over ideas in the head before sleep, and that can be a problem. So uh, treating depression and anxiety can be helpful as well. If none of these non-pharmacologic approaches are helpful, melatonin is a natural substance that the body produces that uh, fluctuates during the 24-hour uh, period and induces sleep. And that is a medication that can be given to enhance our body's own production of melatonin can be very helpful in inducing sleep. If none of these work, 
then a sleep aid may be the next step and a referral to a sleep specialist may be uh, an appropriate step as well. Another problem uh, that one sees in PD is something called sleep fragmentation. And this refers to brief arousals that occur during a period of sleep. And this can lead to poor sleep quality, decreased restfulness, and excessive daytime sleepiness, which we'll discuss later. The person themselves may not be aware that he or she is having arousals at all, and they may only be seen on a sleep study. And this is one of the reasons why a sleep study may be valuable. So here is an example of what sleep fragmentation might look like in a graph uh, form. The top graph are young adults, and this is the normal cycle that we saw before, where REM sleep and non-REM sleep cycle about every one and a half hours through the night. As we age normally, and in PD it's even worse, this cycle shortens dramatically and there may be very frequent periods where a person wakes up in the night so short that they're not aware that they're happening. And this uh, can be very, very disruptive of sleep. You don't get a good night, good stretch of good sleep, and this could lead to problems with, uh, with restfulness. Let's turn now to restless leg syndrome. This refers to an uncomfortable sensation in the legs, sometimes in the arms, which is temporarily relieved by movement. It's often described by the person as either a crawling, electric, itching or aching feeling, a very annoying sensation, making the person want to move. And it can occur in the evening and the night and can prevent or interrupt sleep. Now, it's very important to note is that restless leg syndrome can be an independent disorder, not associated with PD at all. So just because you have restless leg syndrome does not mean that PD is in your future, that they can be completely separate disorders. However, people with PD might have increased rates of restless leg syndrome. Restless leg syndrome can also be associated with damage to the nerves in the hands and feet, also known as peripheral neuropathy and can be associated with iron deficiency. And so these two conditions should be investigated if somebody has restless leg syndrome, whether or not it's related to PD as well. Now there have no, been no specific studies done for treatment of restless leg syndrome in PD specifically, but there are treatments for restless leg syndrome in general. And very interestingly, treatments for restless leg syndrome can be the same treatments that are used to treat Parkinson's disease. So despite the fact that many people who have restless leg syndrome will not become people who have PD, they are nevertheless treated with the medications that treat PD. So this implies that there is a link between these two conditions. So dopamine agonists can be used to treat restless leg syndrome with or without PD. Levodopa itself can be used to treat restless leg syndrome with or without PD, as well as medications such as gabapentin or pregabalin. And these are medications you can speak with your physician about if this is a problem for you. Let's turn now to another sleep disorder associated with PD, sleep apnea. This is a sleep disorder in which breathing stops and starts through the night. This breathing problem leads to periods of low oxygenation in the blood and frequent awakenings. Parkinson's disease may be associated with the two types of sleep apnea that are documented. One is called central sleep apnea, and this refers to a decreased drive to breathe during sleep, and it is due to brainstem lesions. As we already discussed, patients with Parkinson's disease can have Lewy bodies throughout their brainstem, causing many different kinds of symptoms, and this is one of those problems that can occur. There's another type of sleep apnea called obstructive sleep apnea. And this is due to the abnormal function of the muscles of the upper airway, causing blockages, therefore leading to decreased oxygenation during the night. Most commonly in the general population, this obstructive sleep apnea is due to sometimes obesity, extra, um, uh, tissue in the area of the upper airway, which causes the blockage. And sometimes weight loss is helpful for that. Um, in Parkinson's disease, the obstructive sleep apnea is not due to excess tissue, but to an abnormal function in the muscles. 
Regardless, you can have a combination of obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea in Parkinson's disease. The way this condition is diagnosed is via a sleep study. And what you would see are dips in the oxygen level throughout the night. And that would be the way to confirm that this is what's going on. The reason it's important to know whether or not you have sleep apnea specifically is because untreated sleep apnea, which means that you have dips in your oxygen levels in the night, can raise the risk of unrelated conditions like heart disease and stroke. It can uh, cause depression, poor memory and headaches. And so this is definitely a syndrome that if suspected, a sleep study can really help uh, many elements. So what are the treatments? So the first is simple, you wanna elevate the head of the bed. Sometimes an oral appliance can help open the airway. And sometimes what's needed are devices that actually push air into the airway during the night. And these are called CPAP or BiPAP. These are non-invasive ventilation systems. So we just discussed a whole array of sleep disorders that can be associated with PD. We know that sometimes using a sleep study can help diagnose them. We discussed a little bit about treating each of them. Now let's move to a second category of sleep disorders that a person with PD may be grappling with. And these are sleep disorders that result from PD medications. And the two we'll be discussing are vivid dreams or nightmares. It's very common to get nightmares from dopaminergic Parkinson medications. These can be just simply very vivid dreams. They may not be upsetting at all. But they can be very upsetting and cause a person to wake up upset, and that can interfere with sleep. A simple solution sometimes is just moving that last dose of Parkinson medication to earlier in the day, and that could solve the problem. Another problem that can occur with Parkinson's disease medications is something called sleep attacks, which is falling asleep without warning, falling asleep without any sign that you were tired. This can be very problematic doing something like driving, so there's no warning that you're tired and so you shouldn't be driving, and nevertheless you fall asleep. Um, this can be a problem specifically with dopamine agonist medications, and it's definitely something to think about before the medication is started. The third type of sleep problems that can affect somebody with PD are when a symptom of Parkinson's disease interferes in sleep. So as you are aware, Parkinson's disease symptoms are divided into the motor symptoms, and these are the symptoms that affect movement. These are tremor, slowness, stiffness, and balance problems or postural instability. And these we typically think of as the symptoms of the iceberg that can be seen above the water. These are symptoms that can be seen, they're visual. However, there are many non-motor symptoms, and these are represented as a big part of the iceberg beneath the water, a very problematic part of the iceberg yet not seen. And these are the symptoms that do not affect movement. There are a number of Parkinson's disease symptoms, both motor and non-motor, that can affect sleep. And I've highlighted these in yellow. So the motor symptoms that can affect sleep, tremor and stiffness. So people may wake up with tremor, they make up, may wake up with a sense of rigidity that impedes their ability to go back to sleep. The non-motor symptoms that may affect sleep, anxiety, hallucinations, pain, and urinary problems. And we'll discuss each of these in turn. Anxiety. So anxiety refers to worrisome thoughts, and these can keep a person from falling asleep both at the start of the night or from falling back asleep upon awakening during the night. Now, everyone has experienced this at some point in a very stressful part of their life. They may ruminate or play certain thoughts over again and again. And people with Parkinson's may have this as a more persistent problem. So this is certainly something that I hear a lot about interrupting sleep and invading sleep. So what are the treatment options? One are lifestyle modifications. Exercise, meditation during the day may help to quell some of those thoughts before bed and at night. Cognitive behavioral therapy is definitely something to consider. Try to find more uh, useful ways of dealing with those ruminating thoughts. And if those don't work, medications, 
uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, may be helpful uh, to help these thoughts. And again, we don't have um, enough data to recommend a specific one of these SSRIs or SNRIs for anxiety and PD. This is a topic that requires much more uh, research that has not yet been done, but certainly anecdotally we know that these medications can be helpful and is something to discuss with your physician. Hallucinations. Hallucinations are very common in PD and they're typically a side effect of our dopaminergic medications, which can all cause hallucinations. Hallucinations can also be part and parcel of Parkinson's disease itself. And so uh, both of those should be considered as the cause of potential cause of hallucinations. Common hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, furry animals, babies, cute, uh, cuddly animals, sometimes dead relatives. And sometimes these images are pleasant Sometimes the person is aware of, of that these are hallucinations and they're not bothered by them. But sometimes the hallucinations can be very upsetting and can be very disturbing. And a person may wake up to a hallucination and then find it very difficult to return to sleep. And so dealing with hallucinations can be one way to help improve sleep. And there are strategies to help improve hallucinations. One would be to adjust Parkinson's disease medications. And if that's not effective, there are medications available to try to quell hallucinations. Urinary symptoms. So urinary symptoms are extremely common in Parkinson's disease, and they can certainly interrupt sleep. They can interrupt sleep for many older adults with or without Parkinson's disease. And these symptoms include urinary urgency, a real sense that you need to get to the bathroom immediately, frequency, you need to go to the bathroom a lot, and nocturia, simply having to go to sleep specifically, having to go to the bathroom, I'm sorry, specifically at night um, a lot. Sometimes there's frank incontinence where urination uh, happens without your control. So to treat this problem, um, certainly you want to be assessed for other causes of urinary issues. For example, an enlarged prostate is a very common cause of urinary problems in the general population, general male population, and can also be a problem for Parkinson's disease patients too, and that should be investigated. Now, urinary issues of Parkinson's disease can be treated with medications, but some of the most common medications used for urinary symptoms in the general population can have cognitive side effects. And so you wanna be careful uh, with your urologist about which medication to choose. Um, and sometimes that requires a conversation between the urologist and the neurologist. And finally, botulinum toxin injections could be considered. And this is of the bladder, and this is a way to relax the bladder and not have the bladder so tense, wanting that urine to be forced out so frequently. And now let's discuss how motor symptoms may impact sleep. Motor symptoms such as tremor and stiffness can impact sleep. Now, as you know, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease can fluctuate throughout the day depending on the time from the last dose of medication. So typically a person takes a dose of medication and experiences a clinical improvement. And then over time, there may be a return of those symptoms. So what may happen at night is a person takes their last dose of medication before bed, the medication is effective, they're able to go to sleep, but over the course of the night, the medication wears off and the symptoms of Parkinson's return. They wake up for whatever reason in the middle of the night and their Parkinson's motor symptoms have returned with tremor and stiffness and they find it hard to go back to sleep. So how to address this problem? Here is a table of some of the levodopa formulations that are available that can be used to treat um, Parkinson's disease motor symptoms. The top line is the standard formulation of carbidopa levodopa. This is the immediate release medication, um, also referred to as Cinemet. But there are other medications available that may provide more continuous drug delivery. And these may be options for people who need a bit longer, having that on time a little bit longer through the night so that when they wake up, they don't have those symptoms right away. And so there is a carbidopa levodopa extended release or ER, which is generic only. And then there are extended release capsules also known as Ritari. 
And this could be a potential option to take right before bed to see if that gives a little bit of extra help through the night. And finally, there is an intestinal gel, uh, which currently on formulary is meant to be shut off for the night, but that is something to be uh, talked about with your doctor if the uh, problem, the motor problems at night are interfering with sleep. So now what we're going to do is turn to the flip side of trouble sleeping. And that is talking about trouble with level of alertness or maintaining wakefulness during the day. We'll discuss two related but distinct symptoms, fatigue and excessive, excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS. Let's start with fatigue. Now, many people with PD describe fatigue as more encompassing than simply being tired. They'll use words such as I'm run down, I'm out of energy, some will report that sleep is not refreshing and does not relieve the fatigue that they're experiencing. Now, there are many reasons why fatigue might be occurring. The first, of course, is poor sleep. We have just spent the last uh, approximately half an hour discussing why sleep can be poor in Parkinson's disease, and there are many, many reasons. It could be poor sleep hygiene, it could be a PD sleep-related disorder, it could be a sleep disorder from PD medications, it could be a PD symptom that interrupts sleep, et cetera. And all these things can produce a poor sleep night, which can lead to fatigue during the day. And remember, there are some sleep disorders, such as sleep fragmentation, in which the person themselves may think they're getting a really good uninterrupted sleep, but they're not. And so, all these need to be evaluated and considered to try to help the fatigue during the day. Another possibility is that we're dealing with a medication side effect. So Parkinson's disease medications can cause someone to feel tired, as well as other medications that a person may be on. Polypharmacy, where many medications are taken together for various medical problems, may compound the problem. So reviewing medications can be very helpful as well. There may be a related medical issue which is causing fatigue, such as hypothyroidism or thyroid imbalance or anemia. And these things should be evaluated for as well with the complaint of fatigue. Depression. We discussed earlier that sometimes depression in the form of anxiety can rev a person up, but on the flip side, depression can also make a person feel just really low and without energy. That should be evaluated for as well in the, the setting of fatigue. But it could be that a person has a sleep study, does not reveal a problem, there's no medication that can be blamed, there's no medical issue that can be blamed, and there's no depression that can be blamed. And still the person has this unrelenting fatigue, and we hear this from our patients. And so this is something we do not fully understand, but it may be due to neurodegeneration or Lewy bodies in areas of the brain that maintain wakefulness. So it could be uh, its own non-motor symptom that needs to be dealt with separately from the problems that we have discussed up till now. Now let's turn our attention to another problem that's common, which is excessive daytime sleepiness. So fatigue refers to this overwhelming sense of feeling tired. Excessive daytime sleepiness is the inability to actually stay awake during the day. And uh, people report, care partners report that a person with PD may fall asleep for large chunks of the day and not be able to maintain that wakefulness. Um, so both fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness are, are similar, kind of a similar set of causes that need to be considered. And we just went through all those causes uh, on the previous slide. And if any of those causes are revealed, treatment can be directed to it. And so, I, uh, of course, a sleep disorder at night or a medication side effects, depression, they can all lead to both fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness and need to be evaluated to really fully understand the picture. What I should mention is that excessive daytime sleepiness increases in prevalence as PD advances. So this is a symptom that can be seen um, more frequently as Parkinson's disease becomes more um, advanced. And so what are some strategies that improve wakefulness during the day? So if the problem can't be solved with improving sleep at night, are there ways to improve wakefulness during the day nevertheless? And there are. One is to encourage daily exercise and activities. A person without activity um, is more likely to doze off than a person who has activities engaged throughout the day. 
Um, you want to be realistic about scheduling a person, especially if the person has advancing PD, but aiming for at least one scheduled activity a day can be very helpful to people who are battling this excessive sleepiness. Of course, COVID has uh, really been a problem in this uh, arena in getting people more active. Um, it's limited how, how much a person can do during the day, and that is something that we hope uh, we see an end to uh, as soon as possible, and I'm sure everyone will agree with me on that. Another non-pharmacologic intervention that's uh, gaining some momentum is light therapy. Light therapy is a therapy in which a person is exposed to bright light via a light box. It's been used as a treatment modality for various sleep disorders and psychiatric syndromes that are not associated with PD, and there has, have been even a small clinical trial testing its efficacy in PD, and it demonstrated an improvement in both sleep and excessive daytime sleepiness. So this may be something you might hear about a little bit more in the future. There are no FDA approved medications for excessive daytime sleepiness or fatigue in the context of PD. However, clinicians sometimes prescribe medications off label for this very problematic problem. These medications may include modafinil, methylphenidate, caffeine, um, and there is some uh, success uh, with, with these medicines. Of course, there are side effects as well, so please discuss these medications with your physician. Um, and there uh, is a new medicine uh, on the market, relatively new medicine, called estradepilin, and it's a medication currently approved for treatment of motor symptoms of PD. But a small trial recently was done to demonstrate its potential benefit in for excessive daytime sleepiness as well, so perhaps talk with your physician about the possibility of using that medication as well. So to summarize what we have discussed today, we have looked at the various sleep disorders that can affect a person with PD. So the sleep disorders directly associated with PD, sleep disorders that may result from PD medications, common PD symptoms that impact sleep. And then we looked a little bit about the flip side of sleep, wakefulness, we looked at two non-motor symptoms of PD, fatigue and excessive daytime sleepiness, and discussed a little about why they may happen and what potentially we can do about them. So on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope you gained a little bit more insight into your sleep and wakefulness issues in PD. And please feel free to contact me at rgilbert at apdaparkinson.org if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the lecture. Um, and now I will uh, address some of the questions that have come in uh, as we were uh, listening to the lecture. Uh, so the first question is from um, SES. Uh, and this person um, has asked in a couple different ways, hoping you might talk about sleep attacks or drop attacks. Um, and I did talk about that. And then SES qualified that uh, the person she's referring to is actually not on dopamine agonists. So let's just take a step back. Um, sleep attacks are a specific type of uh, sleep disorder where a person falls asleep without warning. So this could be actually quite dangerous. You might be in the middle of doing something that requires attention and then falls asleep um, uh, without feeling tired. Um, this has been associated most strongly with dopamine agonists. And those are medications, um, Pramipexol, Ropinerol, Ritigatine. The brand names are Requip, Mirapex, and Nupro, Nupro Patch. And that is very clearly associated. And uh, it, one needs to be warned about that potential side effect before the medication is uh, prescribed. Um, it's an unusual side effect, doesn't happen frequently, but it is, it is a concerning one. So it, uh, it is highlighted when the medication is first prescribed. It is possible that other dopamine medications are also associated with this type of falling asleep without warning um, to a lesser degree than the dopamine agonists. So to answer SES's question, question. Yes, uh, other medications may be responsible. Um, I think the uh, medication that um, you mentioned specifically was Ritari. 
Um, and, and yes, yeah, so that is, that is a possibility. would definitely bring that up with uh, your physician. Of course, there are non-PD uh, uh, causes of, um, uh, of sleep attacks. Uh, so one would need to consider that as well. But in the context of Parkinson's and Parkinson medications, um, that is, is certainly a possibility. So we'll discuss that with your neurologist. Um, anonymous asked a question, does my PD medication timing impact sleep? So the answer there would be, would be very possibly. Um, uh, Try to highlight a few ways in which Parkinson's disease medications can impact sleep and, and the timing of those medications would have some bearing on the relationship between the medications and sleep. So for example, if the problem with sleep is um, uh, nightmares, then uh, taking a medication too close to bedtime may impact uh, that, that sleep problem. Um, and then the flip side, if the problem with sleep is you wake up in the middle of the night and you have a lot of tremors and, and can't get comfortable because you're too rigid and can't turn successfully in the bed, uh, then potentially a medication closer to bedtime may help. And so uh, one would need to analyze what the exact problem was with sleep and may want to uh, remove medications from close to bedtime or may want to advance medications to be closer to bedtime, uh, depending on what the problem is. In some situations, uh, let's say where there's um, a lot of trouble toward the end of the night, um, sometimes what we recommend is taking an additional dose if you happen to wake up to go to the bathroom and you're up at 2 a.m. to take a dose then. So there are various tricks that can be done to uh, utilize the medications and their timing to help with, uh, with sleep. We have a question here from Sherry. Will antidepressant side effects make a person more tired? Um, and that is a, a very good question and it very much depends on which antidepressant. So there are particular antidepressants that will uh, activate a person and make them less tired. And there are particular antidepressants that, are actu that can actually make you tired. And sometimes those antidepressants are actually prescribed as a sleep aid. So it very much depends on the particular medication so that you would need to discuss with your neurologist or psychiatrist um, to, um, to try to figure out what the relationship is between medication side effect and sleep. So that's a, that's a huge issue. It's uh, something to consider with antidepressants as well as many other medications. We have a question here from Anonymous. Is it okay to take over-the-counter sleep medications with your PD medications? So I did address the concept of taking a medication to help you fall asleep. Um, and there are many medications available, many prescription medications available, um, as well as um, over-the-counter medicines as Anonymous suggested. Um, the major problem with taking a medication that induces sleep is this uh, tendency for the effects to linger and for a person to be tired the next day. Um, and, and because fatigue and sleepiness, as we discussed in this lecture, can be its own problem in PD, we don't necessarily uh, want to um, encourage that problem. And so it's always better to try to attack improving sleep without trying to induce sleep with the medication. Sometimes that's not possible, but those are the first line uh, uh, strategies. Uh, the other issue is that sometimes these medications that induce sleep can also induce fogginess of, of thinking and uh, cause gait problems. And we see this very commonly especially as people age, that these medications can cause this type of problem. And so we are wary of the medications, whether they're over-the-counter or prescription. Over-the-counter medicines in general tend to be less uh, powerful. Um, and so uh, given the choice, we, we uh, would like to consider over-the-counter medicines first, but you wanna discuss all those over-the-counter medicines with your neurologist to make sure that uh, they uh, won't cause or have minimally minimal chance of causing the issues that we just talked about, the cloudiness, the gait problems, the excessive sleepiness the next day. Um, it can be it can be a bit of a battle trying to get everything uh, in balance. 
We have a question here from Claudia. Um, some melatonin bottles have a Parkinson's warning on them. Are there any problems? So I am not aware of a reason why a person with Parkinson's should not be taking melatonin besides what I just went through. The melatonin does induce sleep and on some level can potentially increase sleepiness the next day, et cetera. Uh, melatonin is a bit different than the other over-the-counter medications in that it is a substance that your body produces and what you're doing by taking extra melatonin is sort of uh, adjusting the timing of when your body would have produced melatonin on its own. Um, so you're just uh, shifting when uh, the sleepiness will occur. So it can be very helpful for conditions like jet lag where your body is uh, not used to the clock that you're supposed to be on. And so taking melatonin will um, try to realign the 24 hour clock to the way, to the timing that you want it. And so melatonin is typically a good option among the over the counter options. And we do recommend it frequently for people with Parkinson's. So we have a question here from Anonymous. Uh, what are some non-medicine recommendations for getting a good night's sleep? And so, yes, uh, Anonymous, I'm all with you on this. Uh, you know, as I just went through, taking a medication is is definitely not our first choice. Um, and so we, you know, uh, during the lecture, we went through all the different possibilities for why a person may have impaired sleep. The list is extremely long. And so it's uh, not a guarantee that um, when you it take do some of these recommendations that it will help your sleep because we don't know in your particular case what the issue is. So really analyzing and, and kind of breaking down what the issue is first is going to be helpful and that may require a sleep study, et cetera. But it just all comers looking at general sleep habits, um, you know, one, some of the great recommendations are um, making sure that your bedroom is meant to be a sleep um, Pr uh, promoting environment. So you don't want any screens around screens, uh, meaning iPads or phones or computer screens emit a light that keep you awake. And you just don't want them around bedtime. That's, that's one of the big things you can do to help yourself. Um, you, you know, you may want the, the temperature to be the correct temperature, the lights, the correct lights. You may want to play soft music. You may want to have a noise a cancellation machine, whatever it is to get that room to be a room where you want to go to sleep. And that is, can be extremely helpful. You also don't want to do anything that revs you up right before sleep, like exercise. Even though we always promote exercise, exercise right before bed can be a problem. Um, on the flip side, doing exercise and activities before bed, well, way before bed, can be helpful to get you into uh, the tired zone when it's time to go to sleep. So there are many ways to promote sleep hygiene, which can be the first step in getting yourself better sleep. Um, we have another question. Um, if I'm having vivid dreams and acting things out at night, when should my spouse move to a separate room to sleep? Um, so this is, you know, obviously something that you may be very dependent on the particular couple, um, how bothered the sleep partner is. They may be a really deep sleeper and not be bothered at all. So it really depends on how, um, how disruptive uh, these activities are to your bed partner, and there's no one right answer. Separating the beds may be enough. They may not have to go to a separate room. Um, if the activities actually can injure the bed partner because you're thrashing or punching, um, then obviously things, things are different. So it very much depends on the specific situation. Um, so we just answered the question about exercise. Exercise can help you get a better sleep, but um, that would have to be before bed so that you um, have enough time to sort of calm down before sleep. Um, we have a question here from Shola. Is but blood pressure and Parkinson's disease related? My mother has high blood pressure and PD has normal blood pressure after her morning dose of PD medications, but as the day goes on, her blood pressure goes high even with medications. This is um, a bit of a separate question, not directly related to sleep, but I, I'll address it, address it briefly. Blood pressure can fluctuate widely in someone with Parkinson's, um, possibly or often due to what's called autonomic dysfunction. So a person's um, ability for their blood pressure to uh, be adjusted during the day is controlled by nerves and those nerves can be affected in Parkinson's disease. So 
most typically, uh, the blood pressure can fall when the blood pressure should be higher, um, and that can be associated with Parkinson's disease. Also, the Parkinson's disease medications can cause blood pressure to go down. So the uh, scenario here where the morning dose of medications causes a dip in the blood pressure, and then the blood pressure may shoot back up uh, later in the day, that's a pretty common scenario. Um, so this would have to be a conversation between the person's primary care doctor or cardiologist and neurologist to try to uh, manage this blood pressure and Parkinson's disease medication issue. It can be, can be tricky, but yes, the two can definitely be interrelated. Um, we have a, another question here um, from Karen Frank. Um, I have significant nocturia. I'm going to the bathroom seven to eight times at night. Not so during the day. Can frequency of urination be isolated to nighttime in PD? So the issue of increased urination at night is, um, is common uh, in, in all comers. It is more common to need to go to the bathroom a lot at night more than the day. Um, possibly because you're lying flat and your kidneys are more, um, uh, the circulation in your kidneys is better. And so there's more urine that can be um, produced at night. Um, and so that is a problem um, uh, for, for many people, and it can be a problem for people with Parkinson's as well. And um, that that issue uh, is, is um is very problematic for people who need to sleep. And so trying to find that balance um, to uh, potentially treat it with a medication to try to help you get a good night's sleep is something um, to consider. Um, so uh, we have what, time for just one more question. Um, I'll go with this anonymous question. Can Parkinson's medications cause ED problems? I'm assuming ED here means erectile dysfunction. The question is, the answer is yes. Uh, that is also an autonomic function. It's a function of the body that is not consciously controlled, but it is controlled by nerves, and those nerves can also be affected in Parkinson's disease. So although erectile dysfunction is an extremely common problem as people age, it can also be uh, specifically more problematic for uh, people with Parkinson's disease. So on that note, um, I am being told that I can uh, address no more questions because time is up. I want to thank you so much for your attention, um, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to address those additional questions offline. Thank you so much for your attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference tomorrow. Take care. Hello, my name is Kathy Crane, Executive Director of the American Parkinson Disease Association, Greater St. Louis Chapter. On behalf of everyone at APDA, welcome. And thank you for joining us at the third annual Midwest Parkinson Congress. If you've not already heard, today we set a record for attendance at this event. How exciting to see so many logging on. We're thrilled that you joined us. The overused saying, it takes a village, could not be more true than right now as we develop a virtual community of support. APDA has an incredible extended family to draw upon. I'd like to note a few key members that helped us make today happen. First, all of you with Parkinson's disease, you may think that we keep you going, but let me tell you, you inspire us every day. Your drive, attitude, and optimism keep us going. You're amazing. Next, the doctors, researchers, and specialists, particularly those presenting at this Congress. A big thank you. You generously give your time and expertise. You are important members of our PD family, and we thank you for guiding us through this journey. Then our donors and sponsors. From those of you who thought to add $10 or more to your registration to our 21 sponsors, you made this event possible. Of course, I'm gonna name a few of those sponsors and I'm gonna encourage all the participants to visit the sponsor resource booths. If for no other reason, just to stop and say thank you. It would mean a lot. 
A special shout out to our collaborative sponsors, Arcadia Pharmaceuticals, Emmanuel Emerson Hermetic Motors, and Cura Kern. And our champion sponsors, the name says it all, champion sponsors, are good friends at the James and Allison Bates Foundation and the JCA Charitable Foundation. You are rock stars. Thank you. Today has been a great day. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, stay safe.